while you're getting uh, your seats, we'd like to welcome you to our session number seven of LATAM Focus, which is the BTG Factual Annual Seminar, where we invite our friends and clients to talk about economy, finance, and investment. Today, we have a very interesting program with Minister Felipe que nos acompaña aquí. Gracias, Will, por venir, quien está a cargo del negocio de equities o de renta variable global en BTG. Y también tenemos a Salim Ismail, quien fue director ejecutivo y uno de los fundadores de Singularity University en Silicon Valley. También contamos con la presencia de nuestro socio principal, Andrés Tevez, que nos acompaña este año, y también le vamos a pedir que nos diga unas palabras con, con su visión eh, global eh, de, de negocios y de, y de, y de inversiones. Primero, quería partir haciendo un par de comentarios macro. Hace pocos días el Fondo Monetario actualizó sus proyecciones para la economía mundial, reduciendo marginalmente la estimación de crecimiento para 2019 al 3,3%. Como todos hemos leído, el menor dinamismo económico es parejo tanto a nivel de las economías avanzadas como las emergentes. La excepción, de alguna manera, es Latinoamérica, única región donde el FMI proyecta una aceleración del crecimiento económico. 1,4 para este año, 2,4 para el próximo año y 3% como una tendencia de mediano plazo. Obviamente no es un número espectacular, pero al menos va en la dirección correcta. Detrás de esto hay varias señales económicas positivas. Por una parte, un mayor flujo de capitales, gracias al cambio de tono de la Reserva Federal y la postergación de alzas de tasas, lo que ha traído un ambiente más favorable a los mercados. Segundo, la escasez de materias primas, ha hecho que los términos de intercambio se mantengan estables a pesar de la aceleración en China. Y tenemos un ambiente de compresión de déficit de cuenta corriente, reducción de la inflación y disminución de desequilibrios fiscales en general en la región. Por el lado monetario, casi todas las economías de mayor tamaño de la región, salvo Argentina, han logrado llevar la inflación de vuelta al rango meta de los bancos centrales, lo que da un espacio para mantener tasas de interés bajas e impulsar el crecimiento y contrarrestar los vientos en contra del frente externo. Los factores, los factores internos de cada país, por cierto, son muy importantes y pienso el mayor desafío económico para los gobiernos es continuar haciendo reformas que fomenten la inversión, la productividad, la calidad de los empleos, el buen funcionamiento de los mercados, la inversión en capital humano, así como políticas de protección social que permitan dar respaldo y continuidad a estas reformas. Otro desafío de los gobiernos será prever y tomar medidas proactivas frente a los permanentes cambios tecnológicos a los cuales estarán enfrentados casi todos los sectores económicos en los próximos años. Este cambio tecnológico es una oportunidad y un riesgo al mismo tiempo. Este tema de los factores internos lo cubriremos más adelante. Will, esperamos que nos cuente sobre la reforma previsional en Brasil. Y tal vez el ministro nos cuenta algo de los factores internos en Chile. Con respecto a la evolución de las actividades de BTG en Chile y tendencias del negocio financiero en general, quería hacer tres breves comentarios. Uno, respecto del de negocio de Asset Management. Pensamos que el negocio de Asset Management está pasando por una de las transformaciones más relevantes de los últimos años. El desarrollo tecnológico cambiará la forma en que hacemos las inversiones y cómo estructuramos los productos. En BTG estamos trabajando iniciativas como el lanzamiento de la plataforma BTG Digital, que facilitará el proceso de inversión y mejorará la experiencia del cliente. Otra tendencia en el mundo del asset management es el cambio de perfil de los inversionistas y los atributos que ellos buscan en los fondos en los cuales invierten. El concepto ESG, que ustedes habrán escuchado, que es Environmental, Social and Governance, o sustentabilidad en los negocios, tendrá cada vez mayor relevancia en las decisiones de inversión. Bienvenido, Ministro. Nosotros lo estamos incorporando al robustecer nuestros procesos, el gobierno corporativo, la selección de compañías donde invertimos e incluso en la selección de los directores que nos representan en las empresas. Por último, dentro del negocio de Asset Management está el auge de los activos alternativos, ciertos fondos, de, fondos inmobiliarios, deuda privada, infraestructura, donde BTG es un actor principal, muchos de ustedes son aportantes de nuestros fondos con muy buenos resultados a la fecha. En el último año crecimos en esta categoría y lanzamos una serie de nuevos productos, de fondos de renta residencial, 
deuda con garantía inmobiliaria, deuda privada, etc. Y estos activos alternativos ya representan un 25% de los 4.600 millones de dólares que manejamos en nuestra jefe y que a su vez crecieron un 30% el año pasado. Nuestro foco aquí, por cierto, es hacer buenos negocios que den retorno a nuestros aportantes. Con respecto al... Tres minutos, Ministro, ¿eh? y le doy la palabra. Con respecto a nuestro negocio de banca de inversión y mercado de capitales, creo que es interesante mencionar dos negocios en los cuales estamos participando. Muchos se ha hablado en nuestro país de convertir a Chile en un centro financiero regional. Ustedes saben que es un antiguo anhelo de nuestro mercado de lo que se ha hablado durante muchos años, la verdad sin mucho resultado, creo yo, con un resultado discreto, pongámoslo así. Una de las formas de hacer esto, en nuestra opinión, es desarrollando un mercado para que empresas que no son chilenas en su definición tradicional, se vengan a listar y levanten capital en, el, en nuestro mercado. Entonces los, los dos negocios que estamos trabajando, uno es un aumento de capital de Enel Américas, sobre el cual ustedes habrán leído, Empresa que, como ustedes saben, surgió de la división de la antigua Enersi, es una compañía que no tiene inversiones en Chile, sino que solo fuera de Chile, tiene un agresivo plan de expansión en la región, la última adquisición fue Electropaulo en Brasil, y eso lo están financiando a través del mercado de capitales chileno. Un segundo caso, que incluso va más allá, porque por último esta otra surgió de una compañía chilena, pero un segundo caso, que tal vez ustedes han leído también, es un IPO en que estamos trabajando de una compañía que se llama Atena Foods. Atena Foods es una filial de Minerva, una de las principales empresas procesadoras y distribuidoras de carne en Latinoamérica. Atena Foods concentra todo el negocio latinoamericano ex Brasil. Tiene plantas procesadoras de carne en Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina y Colombia. Y desde ahí exporta a China, principal mercado, Chile, segundo mercado. Esta, esta compañía representa un 30% de la carne de vacuno que todos nosotros compramos en los supermercados en Chile, 30% es de ellos. Bueno, esta compañía quiere crecer y para eso ha decidido hacer su apertura a la bolsa en Chile, siendo que no tiene actividad productiva acá, tiene actividad comercial, pero no productiva. Sin duda es un concepto muy novedoso, similar a cuando en el pasado las empresas chilenas iban a colocar ADRs a Nueva York, pero ahora en Santiago. Nos parece que estas dos operaciones pueden abrir una nueva beta que revitalice nuestro mercado accionario. Según datos de la Bolsa de Comercio, el número de empresas listadas cayó de 230 en 2014 a 210 en la actualidad. O sea, una caída de 10% en los últimos cinco años. Sin embargo, la realidad es peor que esta, porque en el mismo periodo ha habido una serie de OPAs que si bien no han deslistado a las sociedades, han reducido fuertemente su liquidez bursátil. Nosotros mismos en BTG, en los últimos dos meses, hemos hecho las OPAs por Ban Médica, Endesa Chile y Aqua Chile, todas compañías muy importantes que hubieran salido o han disminuido su presencia en el mercado. También hemos hecho aperturas, ¿no es cierto?, como SMU, Tricot, Mall Plaza e Inmobiliaria Banquehue, ahora en enero. Pero estas no logran compensar el volumen de las que han salido de la bolsa. Por todo esto nos parece relevante empujar esta iniciativa de listar en Chile empresas latinoamericanas y así convertirnos en un centro financiero, al menos de la región andina. Pensamos que tenemos todo para hacerlo, la decisión política, la estabilidad macro, bajos costos de financiamiento, calidad regulatoria, capital humano y un sector financiero bien capitalizado. Obviamente que es una cosa experimental, estamos muy optimista respecto a todos los negocios que nos vayan a resultar, si ellos resultan ya tenemos un par de clientes más en el pipeline para repetir el concepto. No solo creemos en Chile Plataforma Financiera Regional, sino que lo estamos haciendo y queremos ser un aporte al mercado en este sentido. Y por último, y con esto termino, quería hacer un breve comentario respecto a nuestro negocio de crédito. Como ustedes saben, hace poco más de dos años nos convertimos en un banco y empezamos a operar como banco. Um, un modelo de banco inversión de segundo piso ¿m? donde ofrecemos crédito a nuestros clientes corporativos family office y personas de alto patrimonio de manera rápida, eficiente y muy conectado con las otras actividades tradicionales que tenemos en BTG ¿M? a la fecha tenemos más de mil millones de dólares en colocaciones que es un monto todavía relativamente pequeño en el contexto de los bancos comerciales pero que ya nos ubica en la cancha ¿M? y agradecemos el apoyo con que hemos contado de parte del mercado que nos ha financiado vía depósitos a plazo y dos emisiones de bonos de BTG Pactual Chile que realizamos el año pasado. 
En un mercado donde predominan las fusiones de bancos y el cierre de otros, somos los únicos que han partido desde cero en el último tiempo, lo cual pensamos también ha sido una contribución al mercado financiero nacional. Gracias nuevamente por acompañarnos en este seminario y los dejo entonces con nuestro flamante Ministro de Hacienda. Don Felipe. Bueno, muy buenos días. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Un gusto estar acá. Eh, me alegra que Memo me presente como flamante. Yo ya no me considero tan flamante, para serle franco. Segundo periodo, segundo año, ¿eh? Eh, cinco años de ir al Congreso, de hecho justo después. Eso le quita a cualquier persona lo flamante. Pero el ánimo al tope, eso sí. Eh, quiero comentarles sobre el tema de Chile creciendo en un contexto más volátil, pero me voy a referir justamente al punto que acaba de plantear eh, Memo Agüero respecto de el Chile Centro Financiero, porque es un desafío que tenemos que tomar en conjunto, es un desafío que hemos planteado como gobierno. Les quiero decir una cosa, es cierto que se viene discutiendo hace tiempo Chile Centro Financiero Regional y que se ha planteado hace mucho tiempo. ¿Sabe la diferencia? La diferencia es que lo, nosotros lo vamos a hacer. Esa es la diferencia. Porque de hablar de Centro Financiero, pero quiero decirle que vamos, estamos haciendo cosas concretas y desde ya los quiero dejar invitados Acabamos de hacer algunos anuncios en Chile Day, Nueva York, que es como nuestro semianual, y luego viene el anual al que dejamos invitados para Chile Day en Londres, donde vamos a seguir progresando en este tema. Bueno, eh, un breve repaso a lo que nos ha pasado, porque de repente a mí me parece que se nos dice, oye, eh, ustedes son un poquito más altas las metas, ¿eh? y de repente se pierde un poco la perspectiva de dónde venimos y cuál es el contexto mundial en que estamos eh, involucrados. Bueno, esto es bien interesante lo que pasó con Chile y el mundo en el año 2019. En primer lugar, todas las expectativas, las proyecciones de crecimiento mundial durante 2018 se fueron corrigiendo a la baja. Y esto si ustedes ven, por ejemplo, comparen, pues de repente hay personas que dicen, o algunos, no, es que yo esperaba que Chile creciera más. ¿Cuándo esperaba usted que Chile creciera más? Pregunto yo. Porque a fines de 2017 las expectativas de crecimiento para la economía chilena eran 3%. Crecimos al 4%. Y nuestras expectativas de crecimiento, las proyecciones, se fueron revisando durante el año sistemáticamente al alza hasta terminar en 4% a fin de año, mientras las proyecciones de crecimiento de la economía mundial iban a la baja. Eh, la actividad industrial mundial en lo que va de 2019 se ha desacelerado. Estamos en un contexto de desaceleración de la economía mundial. De hecho, ya vamos a revisar, porque si ustedes ven, eh, en términos de tanto de la producción industrial como del PMI manufacturero, un índice, eh, ambas están eh, debilitándose. Y el volumen de comercio mundial también disminuye en lo que va del año 2019. Eh, el último trimestre móvil es eh, más o menos sintomático, en que había una caída importante en el comercio, porque antes estábamos con cifras modestas pero positivas, ahora hemos tenido una pequeña corrección a la baja en comercio mundial en el último trimestre móvil. Luego, además, en la proyección de comercio mundial de 4.7 a 3.4, eso en abril, entre abril de 18 y abril de 2019, pero es la proyección para el mismo año, es lo que ha pasado en los últimos 12 meses respecto a la proyección para el mismo año. ¿Y qué ha pasado en este contexto con nuestras autoridades monetarias <coughs> mundiales? que han ido reconociendo un escenario externo más complejo, más desafiante y han modificado su trayectoria de tasa. O sea, hoy día tenemos una trayectoria de tasa externa que es distinta, que ha cambiado. ¿Por qué? Porque eh, resulta que el mundo está con crecimientos más bajos de los que se habían proyectado. Y con esto tenemos a la FED, a la Reserva Federal, en pausa. ¿No es cierto? Y el Banco Central Europeo que ha dicho que va a mantener más tiempo el periodo en que va a inyectar liquidez, que está haciendo uso del relajamiento cuantitativo, del QI, ¿no es cierto?, y que va... Entonces, se va a mantener la, la política monetaria 
por un tiempo más largo en condiciones más laxas. Ahora uno dice, bueno, esto es positivo. Bueno, positivo, pero lo que pasa es que eh, esto es una manera de responder de los mercados frente a una situación de, eh, de un crecimiento mundial más moderado. Los organismos internacionales han recortado las proyecciones 2019 para Latinoamérica y el mundo, mientras que mantienen relativamente estable las de Chile. Este es mío, perdón. ¿Usted tomó? No. Ahí. Qué importante saber, porque uno en esta época tiene que cuidarse mucho. Bueno, eh, entonces mantienen relativamente estables de Chile, o sea, tenemos el crecimiento en torno a 3,4%, 3,4%, 3,5%, pero se han ido revisando a la baja las proyecciones de crecimiento mundiales. Yo les quiero solamente decir de que desde julio del año pasado, el Fondo Monetario en su World Economic Outlook ha recortado el crecimiento desde una proyección de 3,9% a una proyección de 3,3%, más de medio punto de diferencia de crecimiento. Eso no es menor. Entonces nosotros estamos involucrados en este escenario. Eh, el ACEPAL nos da 3.3, 3.4, el Banco Central nos da 3.5. Nosotros estamos más cerca del Banco Central, pero obviamente que estamos, hemos sincerado que la proyección de crecimiento para Chile, no, aunque no hemos hecho un cambio en la proyección oficial, que lo vamos a hacer próximamente, hemos dicho es muy difícil crecer al 3.8, que fue la proyección que hicimos en septiembre del año pasado. Eh, entonces, bueno, y Latinoamérica con un crecimiento de 1,3%. O sea, la realidad es que Latinoamérica va a la baja. Y Chile es de los pocos países latinoamericanos cuyas proyecciones de crecimiento 2019 no se revisaron a la baja en el último World Economic Outlook. De hecho, se mantuvieron solamente... Eh, República Dominicana y algo Argentina. Ahora, yo no sé cómo ir a revisar el World Economic Outlook después de los últimos acontecimientos de Argentina, que lamentamos, ¿no es cierto?, la situación compleja que está viviendo ese país. Pero cuando uno mira y ve la situación de Chile, eh, yo creo que hay que mirar lo que está pasando en el vecindario. Hay que mirar lo que está pasando en el mundo. Y hay que mirar en particular lo que está pasando en el mundo emergente. Hemos sido capaces de sortear la mayor incertidumbre global. Fíjense que aquí hay dos índices. Un índice de incertidumbre local y otro índice de incertidumbre eh, global. Y el índice de incertidumbre global ha ido al alza. El índice de incertidumbre local <coughs> está estable, con pequeños altibajos, pero básicamente sin tendencia. Y tal vez lo que es más notable, ¿eh? Eh, esto yo no lo he visto, le digo, no lo he visto destacado en la prensa, pero tal vez es porque el dato es reciente. Resulta que Chile tiene el riesgo país medido por Credit Default Swaps a cinco, a cinco años, el CDS, el riesgo país más bajo de todo el mundo emergente. Es bien notable esto. ¿eh? No hay ningún país emergente según la clasificación del Fondo Monetario Internacional. De hecho, Chile es de los países que ha caído en su riesgo país medido por CDS a cinco años. Eh, durante el año 2019 y tiene riesgo país más bajo que China en este momento ¿eh? que China, que Tailandia, que Perú que Panamá, el más bajo de Latinoamérica pero también el más bajo de todo el mundo emergente, entonces estas son condiciones que tienen que ver con esta idea de desarrollar también en Chile un centro financiero el centro financiero tiene que ver con tener condiciones macroeconómicas estables con tener un riesgo bajo y esto es reconocido por los mercados internacionales porque ¿sabe lo que pasa? que uno puede contar el cuento que quiera pero los mercados nos ponen nota todos los días uno puede decir lo que quiera pero todos los días se transan estos papelitos y es lo que determina el mercado cómo consideran el riesgo de los distintos países y este riesgo es el más bajo del mundo emergente yo creo que eso es una cosa sin duda muy positiva para nuestra economía y yo quiero destacar algo que no es Insisto, no es algo de este gobierno, es parte de lo que... Porque realmente uno dice que uno tiende a tirar, es tan humano tirar agua para el molino propio. Y es una tentación que uno tiene que resistir, ¿no es cierto? Pero esto es algo que viene de la institucionalidad macroeconómica chilena. Tenemos tipo de cambio flotante. ¿Y qué ha significado el tipo de cambio flotante? Fíjense ustedes, Chile ahí, en el eje Y tenemos la volatilidad del tipo de cambio. Entonces Chile tiene, como tiene tipo de cambio flotante, tiene un tipo de cambio que es relativamente más volátil que el de otros países. Por supuesto, si usted tiene tipo de cambio fijo, la volatilidad de tipo de cambio es cero en la medida que pueda mantener el cambio fijo. ¿Pero qué pasa con la volatilidad de tasa de interés? Y eso es parte de nuestra mezcla macroeconómica. 
con Banco Central Autónomo, con regla fiscal y tipo de cambio flotante. Que con tipo de cambio flotante resulta que la volatilidad de la tasa a 10 años es muy baja. Entonces la mezcla nuestra es que la volatilidad, el que absorbe los shocks es el tipo de cambio. Y la tasa de interés es la, una variable muy relevante en las decisiones de inversión, algunas de consumo durable también tiene una estabilidad muy alta. Entonces yo creo que esta combinación es muy buena, tener que, la, que los shocks que todos los países tienen, ¿a dónde van los shocks? ¿Quién absorbe shocks? ¿Qué variable macroeconómica absorbe shocks? En Chile el tipo de cambio, y muy poco la tasa. Positivo. Bueno, tenemos un sólido impulso interno. Durante 2018 el motor del crecimiento fue la demanda interna, que el PIB creció 4, la demanda interna creció 4,7%, y el consumo de hogares creció 2,5%, el consumo de gobierno, no es que creció 2,5%, perdón, esos son los aportes al crecimiento. En azul, los aportes al crecimiento. O sea, si ustedes suman, todo lo que está en azul les da 4, ¿Mm? para decirlo así. O sea, no es que los en rojo son crecimientos y en azul son contribuciones al crecimiento. Y eso es para que estén atentos. Eh, bien, entonces, si ustedes suman acá, les da justamente 4. El consumo de hogares representa más del 60% del eh, crecimiento, de la contribución al crecimiento. El consumo de gobierno, poco. La inversión. O sea, ¿qué es lo que está empujando el crecimiento económico? El consumo privado y la inversión. En realidad, como vamos a ver en un momento, eh, es la inversión, eh, la recuperación del crecimiento 2018 es fundamentalmente basada en la inversión. Y eso es muy importante. Eso es el, el gran cambio es la recuperación de la inversión, también de la productividad total de factores. Las exportaciones crecen y, por supuesto, las importaciones sustraen de esta ecuación. Eh, en 2019 vamos a volver a liderar en crecimiento de la inversión en Latinoamérica. Además, la inversión va a continuar fuerte, sustentada en los sectores no mineros. Esto es bien interesante, porque de repente se dice, bueno, Chile es solo minería. No. Esta recuperación de inversión tiene que ver en parte con inversión minera, pero en parte con inversión no minera. Y las proyecciones que se hacen para los próximos años son de que el crecimiento de la inversión va a estar sustentada en los sectores no mineros. Es decir, es una recuperación de inversión generalizada. Y responde, entre otros favores, entre otros factores, a una significativa mejora de la confianza empresarial. Por ahí la confianza empresarial tiene altibajos, pero no hay duda de que hay una recuperación muy importante de la confianza empresarial. Y ustedes saben, todos los modelos de inversión dicen que dependen de cálculos probabilísticos, pero también de confianza, de factores que son más subjetivos, pero que entran en forma importante en las decisiones de inversión. La inversión, estamos generando más y mejores empleos, estamos yendo aquí a una... Eh, a los datos de la Corporación de Bienes de Capital que dicen que el empleo directo generado por proyectos de inversión 2018-22 va a estar a diciembre de 2018, se decía, vamos a tener proyección de la Corporación de Bienes de Capital 72.000 empleos generados por los proyectos de inversión, que han crecido en forma muy importante, entre junio del 18 y diciembre del 2018 han crecido 50% los proyectos, este es el famoso catastro de la Corporación de Bienes de Capital que está sesgado, hay que decirlo, está sesgado hacia proyectos más grandes bueno, y el número de cotizantes, hay muchas medidas, ¿eh? la medida del INE, que se está corrigiendo, pero si ustedes ven, por ejemplo, los cotizantes en el sistema de pensiones y cesantía, en, eh, en el sistema de pensiones, el número de cotizantes creció año a año, a diciembre de 2018, en 166.000. Y si ustedes van a ver, el número de cotizantes del seguro de cesantía crece más de 200.000. Entonces tenemos algunos indicadores que no son directamente los indicadores del INE, es metodología que también está usando el Banco Central de tomar una serie de indicadores para ver qué está pasando con el, eh, con el empleo. Aquí tenemos un, un tema muy interesante y un tema mayor, el alza de la inmigración, que va a contribuir a impulsar la fuerza de trabajo. De hecho, se estima que, estamos aquí tomando las últimas cifras de línea al respecto, que el, los migrantes representan hoy cerca del 7% de la población nacional. Ahora, hemos tenido un flujo migrante y eso hay que decirlo, el mercado laboral chileno ha sido capaz de absorber un flujo de en cuatro años del orden de 800.000, 850.000 migrantes, la mayor parte de los cuales vienen a buscar trabajo, que están hoy día en proceso de regularización. Y ha sido capaz de absorberlo sin aumento en las tasas de desempleo. Ahora, alguien podrá decir, oiga, pero ¿sabes? no han caído las tasas. Sí, efectivamente no han caído, pero, pero miren el aumento de la fuerza laboral. 
Y toda esta población que llega a nuestro país tiene que, ha encontrado, en buena medida, ha encontrado un trabajo. Eh, PIB tendencial, porque no solamente nos importa el PIB eh, nominal, o sea, el, perdón, el PIB eh, del, del año, sino el PIB tendencial. Y vemos un aumento por mejores perspectivas de inversión. Fundamentalmente fue la inversión la que impulsó el PIB tendencial en 2018, de 2.6 a 2.9, y nosotros esperamos que haya una mejora significativa del eh, PIB tendencial en los años que vienen. Nuestro objetivo como gobierno es apoyar a que el PIB tendencial de Chile vaya no a los niveles que está hoy día, que está en torno al 3, 2, 9, 3, sino que esté entre 3 y medio y 4. Ahora eso no es menor porque estamos hablando de un punto de crecimiento en el crecimiento en en el PIB tendencial, digamos las proyecciones de crecimiento tendencial que son las que Chile puede sostener en el mediano y largo plazo. IPTF, la productividad total de factores. Bueno, tuvimos una, un crecimiento de 1,3% el año pasado. Eh, ahora, quiero hacer una prevención acá. Esta es la PTF de la Comisión Nacional de Productividad y es interesante ver que la productividad laboral también salta en forma importante, pero si hay una corrección en el empleo por por incorporar a los inmigrantes, vamos a tener algo menos de PTF y algo más de crecimiento de empleo. Para el mismo crecimiento del PIB, la composición de ese crecimiento va a variar hacia algo menos de productividad y algo más de... De todas maneras, vamos a tener la productividad en torno a 1% y, en, y, el, eh, digamos, y, y el empleo creciendo algo más. Bien, otro de los elementos <coughs> fundamentales, cuando uno ve por qué Chile tiene las, los credit default swaps que es el indicador de riesgo más bajo del mundo emergente. Bueno, tiene que ver con la consolidación fiscal y con el hecho de que hemos tenido un progreso fiscal importante en el último año y hemos dedicado parte de nuestros esfuerzos a la consolidación fiscal. Esfuerzo que a veces no es muy entendido y además no es muy popular, porque esto se ha logrado de dos maneras. Esto se ha logrado a través de un programa de contención de gastos y a través de una mejora de ingresos por la recuperación económica. Y es así como... Hemos tenido una reducción significativa del déficit estructural. Ahora, yo, aquí el año 2018, yo quiero simplemente mencionar que nosotros nos habíamos comprometido a 1.8, a bajar el, el, el déficit estructural del 2 al 1.8 y terminamos en 1.5. Pero nosotros queremos ser claros y hemos sido claros, esto se debe a una operación puntual, ¿ya? que es la operación eh, que ustedes conocen de la venta de las acciones de SQM, de Nutrien a Tianqui, esa operación generó mil millones de dólares. En realidad, mil millones de dólares de recaudación fiscal. Este es un cheque que recibimos de mil, quiero decir las cifras exactas, mil dos coma cinco. Estas son las cosas que a nosotros nos producen emoción. ¿Por qué? Un cheque de más de mil millones de dólares de recaudación fiscal es algo que llega al corazón. Y... Y realmente, ahora, nosotros podríamos haber decidido, esto es un tema de política, gastarlo y cumplir la meta. A nosotros nos comprometimos, el decreto que firma el Presidente de la República y el Ministro de Hacienda, que lo tiene que hacer a los 90 días de cambio de gobierno, tiene el déficit estructural. El compromiso se hace en base al balance estructural y no al gasto de gobierno. Nosotros pasamos la meta, pero la pasamos por una operación puntual. Nos pareció más prudente ahorrar ese ingreso extraordinario, que gastarlo, aunque habiéndolo gastado entero, habríamos podido cumplir con lo que nos comprometimos. Bueno, también ha caído el déficit efectivo, cayó más de 1,1 puntos. Este 1,1 punto significa 3.400 millones de dólares de mayor, eh, o sea, de, de esfuerzo fiscal. 3.400 millones de dólares, más o menos el PIB chileno es algo más de 300.000 millones hoy día, PIB total. Entonces, 1,1 punto está cerca de los 3.400. Eh, esto, a su vez, eh, mejora, es interesante porque el año 2018 Chile mejoró su posición estructural en 0,5 puntos del PIB, las economías avanzadas la deterioraron, en una medida del Fondo Monetario Internacional, las economías avanzadas deterioraron su posición fiscal estructural en 0,3 puntos del PIB y las economías emergentes prácticamente no se movieron una recuperación de 0,05. Eh, nos, nos, nos satisface que 
hemos logrado consolidar la posición fiscal. Ahora, esto no es que estemos listos. ¿eh? O sea, hay un cronograma, hay un esfuerzo que tiene que continuar para seguir consolidando la posición fiscal de Chile. Y eso significa que eh, el compromiso de balance estructural continúa. Nosotros tenemos que estabilizar el crecimiento de la deuda pública. Porque si ustedes ven, eh, nosotros venimos de un, una duplicación de la deuda. Yo lo digo con toda tranquilidad porque esto es unas cifras. La deuda se duplicó en cuatro años y nosotros... Y además se duplicó, pasó de 12,7% del PIB a 23,6% en cuatro años. El año pasado pasó a 25% y nosotros lo que queremos hacer es estabilizar la deuda a PIB. Esto es una de las cosas que más les preocupa a los analistas externos, que más miran, que más miran las clasificadoras de riesgo. Y esto no es porque uno quiera satisfacer las clasificadoras de riesgo. En realidad... Eh, eh, no nos preocupan mucho las clasificadoras, lo que, nos importa, lo que nos importa son los efectos de la clasificación de riesgo. Porque una menor clasificación de riesgo significa un mayor... Nosotros calculábamos que la, eh, la baja en la clasificación de riesgo de un notch, ¿eh? un peldaño en clasificación de riesgo, nos costó alrededor de 160 millones de dólares anuales en intereses. Eso es una cantidad relativamente importante. Bien. Eh, hacia el desarrollo integral yo solamente quiero comentar brevemente ustedes conocen el proyecto de modernización tributaria este es un proyecto que genera un mayor crecimiento anual de algo más de 0,5 eso es lo que nos da a nosotros en nuestro modelo algo más de 0,5 en la inversión aumenta entre 2 y 2,5 y ¿por qué? porque tenemos incentivos a la inversión depreciación acelerada depreciación instantánea en una parte del periodo y en empleo entre 60.000 y 80.000 empleos esto para la próxima década es un proyecto muy importante eh, que lo que aspira es generar mayor crecimiento inversión, empleo eh, y hacerle la vida más fácil a las pymes, simplificar y dar certeza jurídica al contribuyente. Y, y nosotros estamos conscientes de que eh, estamos en el Congreso, tenemos que negociar y lo estamos haciendo. Y esperamos poder llegar a un acuerdo en el proyecto tributario. Es un proyecto importante para Chile. Eh, solamente un detalle, ¿eh? porque a veces se nos dice, no, pero este es un proyecto para los... Eh, el eslogan es que es un proyecto para los que tienen más, y es bien curioso, porque los que más se han manifestado son los dirigentes de las pymes, representantes de tres organizaciones de pymes que representan a 900.000 pymes, pidieron aprobar la idea de legislar y piden avanzar en el proyecto, eh, en el proyecto tributario. Bien, a veces hay opiniones que aquí, esta es la opinión de la OCDE, ¿no es cierto?, respecto del proyecto tributario, en una carta que recibimos a comienzos de año, la OCDE dijo claramente la integración tributaria debiese aumentar la eficiencia respecto al sistema existente. Junto a la depreciación acelerada y una devolución del IVA al activo fijo más acelerada, debería impulsar la inversión y el crecimiento. Eso, entonces algunos dicen, oiga, pero es que tal persona dice, mire, la OCDE, el Fondo Monetario, eso dice el Fondo Monetario, la OCDE dice, varias medidas de la propuesta tributaria apoyarán la inversión y el crecimiento, tales como el retorno a un sistema tributario único y totalmente integrado, un régimen mejorado para las pymes, nuevas reglas diseñadas para la certeza tributaria, la depresión tributaria acelerada y el reembolso más rápido del IVA. Bastante coincidente el análisis del de Fondo Monetario y la OCDE, que no tienen velas en el entierro acá, ¿eh? O sea, cuando se dice, no están involucrados en la discusión política, que yo trato de ganar un punto aquí o allá, ¿eh? sino que opiniones objetivas de entidades que respetamos. Entonces yo digo, muchas veces citamos a la OCDE. Yo digo, citemos a la OCDE completo. ¿eh? Citémoslo completo. ¿Y qué es lo que le dice la OCDE? La OCDE dice lo que ustedes están eh, apreciando acá. Bueno, Chile Centro Financiero. Déjenme entrar un minuto a este tema. Y con esto terminar también, porque eh, me tengo que ir al paraíso. A mí me gustan los cerros de Valparaíso. <risa> eh, bueno, Chile Centro Financiero. Yo les quiero contar que la regulación, las reformas regulatorias, reformas legales, sí tienen impacto y pueden generar un impacto significativo. Entonces dice, con, claro, con razón en el mercado financiero dice, nos falta mucho. Sí, claro, nos falta, pero no olvidemos esta reforma, la Ley Única de Fondo, aprobada en marzo de 2014, generó un cambio importante en las condiciones de administración de fondos. Y fíjense que de pasar de administrar en torno a 10 mil millones de dólares, hoy día las cifras son de una administración en los fondos de inversión, de un total de 
eh, superior a los 25 mil millones de dólares. O sea, una reforma regulatoria, una reforma legal, puede tener efectos muy importantes. Y menciono el caso de la luz. Eh, ahora, la ley única de fondos no es lo único, y estamos involucrados en una serie de otras cosas. Y nosotros estamos mirando, fíjense, a los países que han tenido éxito en ser centro financiero. La primera cosa que voy a destacar acá, y es que no hace falta ser grande para ser un centro financiero de clase mundial. Países pequeños, fíjense ustedes, Luxemburgo, Singapur, Suiza, Reino Unido, claro, algo más grande, Irlanda, todos países, excepto Reino Unido, todos países pequeños. Y todos países que son centros financieros regionales. Y nosotros cómo estamos en diversos indicadores de gobernabilidad e indicadores de facilidad para hacer negocios. Bueno, en control de la corrupción, efectividad del gobierno, calidad regulatoria e imperio de la ley. Generalmente los indicadores estamos mucho mejor que América Latina y estamos, claro, no estamos a los niveles eh, en general de estos grandes mercados internacionales. En facilidad para hacer negocios. Fíjense usted, protección a los inversionistas minoritarios, estamos ahí con un nivel de 60, claro que estamos mejor que Luxemburgo. Es curioso, Luxemburgo es centro financiero y no protege mucho a los minoritarios, al menos en el, estamos mirando ya estos índices globales para medirnos con una métrica y saber dónde estamos en cada una de estas cosas que son necesarias para ser un centro financiero eh, regional. Eh, luego, en facilidad de pago de impuestos, ahí estamos, todavía podemos progresar. Esto es antes de la modernización tributaria, nosotros con eh, la modernización tributaria estimamos que vamos a tener un salto muy significativo en este índice que es facilidad para del pago de impuestos. Hoy día en Chile se usa más del doble de las horas promedio de la OCDE para hacer el pago de impuestos, horas destinadas a cumplir con las obligaciones tributarias, eso lo mide la OCDE, para pymes, más del doble en Chile y nosotros creemos que podemos ir al promedio OCDE con la simplificación que está involucrada en el proyecto. Y también en la facilidad de hacer negocios, eh, bueno, ahí tenemos, nosotros marcamos los puntajes en algunos rangos, entonces evidentemente que tenemos un camino por andar. Y cuando nosotros miramos este proyecto de Chile Centro Financiero Regional, nos damos cuenta que el sector financiero en Chile es más o menos el 5% del PIB, genera del orden de 170.000 empleos. Este es un sector que podría ser tranquilamente sobre 10% del PIB. O sea, podría, ser, podría crecer al doble y más que duplicar la cantidad de empleos que hoy día tiene. Para eso tenemos que trabajar. Yo no digo que este es un proyecto, que esto se va a hacer solo. No se hacen solas las cosas. Y nosotros estamos trabajando en forma coordinada con el Comité de Mercado Financiero, con, por otra parte, en los temas que les compete, con el Banco Central. Estamos trabajando con el Consejo eh, Asesor del Mercado de Capitales del Ministerio de Hacienda y estamos trabajando también con Invest Chile que eh, nos está ayudando en este tema. ¿Para qué? Para generar, a la vez hemos generado una mesa público-privada en que están sentados los distintos reguladores, la unidad de análisis financiero, la UAF, que también es importante que estén estos temas porque de repente se requieren algunos requisitos de la UAF que son complejos desde el punto de vista de Chile Centro Financiero y el Servicio de Impuestos Internos. Están sentadas todas las autoridades. Para que podamos entender los problemas, para que podamos... Esta mesa es inédita, ¿eh? que tengamos una mesa con todos los reguladores, las autoridades por un lado y los representantes del sector privado, para entender estos problemas. Luego de esto se va a hacer una recomendación al Ministerio de Hacienda y nosotros tomaremos una definición respecto a los temas que nos parece que son importantes para poder constituir a Chile en centro financiero y regional. Así que yo les digo que a mí me alegra que les vaya bien en la industria financiera, ojalá que esto genere muchos empleos, muchas oportunidades para Chile. Esto de ser centro financiero incluye cosas como la administración de fondos terceros, por supuesto, donde creo que tenemos ventaja competitiva, y también el hecho de ser un país donde se pueda venir a levantar recursos, como lo están haciendo ya algunas empresas. Y nosotros esperamos que eso ocurra más. Chile tiene las condiciones más favorables macroeconómicas a distancia de América Latina las condiciones de estabilidad más grandes, mayores que tiene la región, e incluso lo que mencionábamos dentro del mundo emergente. De tal manera que yo creo que respecto de este punto, 
podemos lograr algo muy importante. Podemos lograr que Chile efectivamente pase a ser un centro financiero regional y con eso aporte al desarrollo de nuestro país. Y yo los llamo a ustedes a trabajar en este proyecto. Esto no se hace solo, no lo hacemos solo desde el gobierno. Trabajen. Oye, y los que estén acá, que, los que crean que tienen, porque a mí me pasa mucho, de repente uno se encuentra en una actividad deportiva, social, y se acerca una persona con una idea. ¿Se han fijado? ¿Se ocurre? Ministro, yo le tengo la solución a su problema. A mí me emociona eso. Se acercan y lo dicen a uno que lo tienen listo. Que... Entonces, todas esas ideas que hay, yo las agradezco. Entréguenlas, háganlas llegar. Hay una entidad que es el Consejo Consultivo de Mercado de Capitales. Aquí hay algunos miembros del Consejo Consultivo de Mercado de Capitales. Pero hagan llegar sus ideas, participen. No se queden como a la expectativa. ¿eh? Decir, ah, que está bonito esto del centro financiero. ¿eh? No. Yo los llamo a que trabajemos juntos y que trabajemos juntos también en beneficio de nuestro país. Porque si Chile puede ser centro financiero, vamos a tener mucho más empleo, mucho más oportunidades y vamos a ver que este bienestar se distribuye y llega a los chilenos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Ministro, por su exposición. Siguiendo el programa, vamos a hacer un pequeño cambio. Eh, no lo teníamos en la agenda, pero se nos ocurrió que, como les comenté al principio, Andrés Tevez, que es nuestro socio principal, está acá. Hace mucho tiempo que Andrés no habla en público, al menos en Chile, eh, y me pareció interesante eh, que nos cuente un poquito cómo está viendo las cosas. Así que, el jefe. Gracias, eh, Juan Guillermo. Gracias a todos por la presencia acá en nuestra conferencia. Yo voy a hacer una breve introducción a Will Landers. Eh, nuestros eh, socios eh, chilenos eh, siempre dicen que nuestro español está muy bien, pero piden que nosotros hablamos en inglés. Uh, yo no comprendo por qué, pero yo soy muy disciplinado. I will speak in English, and uh, we will do the same, even though that we think we have perfect Spanish, or almost that, right? <laughs> uh, I'll make a quick introduction on, uh, we will talk about uh, Latin America and uh, the investment opportunities that we are seeing. And uh, I will do a global introduction uh, 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 on uh, how we are seeing things uh, at this moment. And the good news is, uh, despite the volatility that uh, Minister Lahain described it quite well in the beginning of his presentation, we are constructive about the environment for emerging markets. And uh, Latin America is in the middle of, uh, of this. And uh, why? If you take globally the, the four most important uh, economic or financial regions, Japan, China, Europe, and US, Uh, let's take first uh, 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 Japan and Europe, where we don't think uh, we'll move uh, the needle in terms of financial markets. Then we talk about China and U.S. Uh, in Japan, we'll, uh, we expect more of the same in terms of uh, below target inflation. Uh, as you know, Central Bank of Japan uh, is in a war to move inflation to the direction of their targets, which is 2%. And uh, they have been failing doing that for a while, which is very atypical for us based here in Latin America, right? Um, but this means more monetary expansion, and uh, I don't see a lot of noise coming from there. So let's keep Japan aside. Uh, Europe, even though that uh, they have been uh, frequent uh, presence in the headlines of, uh, of uh, political topics, even in our uh, newspapers here in Latin, Uh, we don't see a lot of, uh, of financial news coming there. Of course, you have some political issues in Italy, you have Brexit, you have uh, political developments in Germany, you have uh, yellow jackets in France. So it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, local confusion. Uh, but on a combined basis, um, we see some sort of, uh, of uh, Japanization uh, uh, in Europe, which means uh, inflation low, 
lower than expected. ECB trying to do what Bank of Japan is doing, uh, not necessarily successful. Some uh, moderate growth, but still quite weak. And uh, uh, I don't see Europe moving financial markets for, for uh, uh, the, the short, uh, short term or middle term. And uh, we don't see these uh, local crises or local challenges, most of them political, uh, at this moment, uh, a big risk for the whole region. So uh, uh, let's concentrate on uh, China and US. Uh, both of them have been the, uh, the key drivers of global markets uh, in the recent period. Um, starting with the relationship between the two of them, which was uh, probably um, a key source of uh, growth reduction last year and still part of this year. Uh, this so-called uh, trade war. Uh, we are more constructive about that, as uh, all of you uh, saw recently. And developments have been uh, more positive, even though not concluded. Um, but we think that uh, uh, probably China has uh, 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 what to offer to U.S. and U.S. Uh, 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 can uh, declare a big improvement in the trade relationship. So if both sides can offer what each other wants, the base case is that the outcome is some sort of agreement or stabilization in this uh, uh, uncertainty around global trade. So that's a first comment. Uh, going more individually to the big countries, uh, China, uh, we had a lot of concerns about uh, growth reduction, a very important uh, 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 foreign commerce on, the, on, this, on this economy. Um, uh, but we consider that probably at this stage, and uh, we have uh, consistent indicators for that, uh, that uh, growth reduction is stabilized. So there was a reduction, but it's stable, which is enough for global financial stability or global financial certainty regarding uh, financial markets. And uh, uh, it's also important when we say some sort of reduction in China, reduction in growth, that the delta or the growth delta of China with this size of economy is quite relevant, right? It's, uh, China grows 5% with this GDP is much more than China growing 10% uh, 10 years ago on that size of, uh, of, uh, of GDP for countries like uh, uh, Chile or Brazil that uh, commodities exporters to China the delta of exports is more or less the same. So it's natural as uh, you see some, net, uh, some uh, evolution to a more uh, modern shape of economy with bigger service sectors and uh, so on, uh, that you have some uh, moderate uh, growth uh, or, uh, or some normalization of growth rates. So we don't see uh, uh, bad news coming on the short middle term in China, so it's the opposite. We see some growth stabilization. Of course, that uh, the huge credit expansion in China uh, 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 that happened in the last decade or even more, it's something that uh, we all need to keep in our radar and probably will be sort of, uh, will be some sort of accommodation in the next 10 years. Difficult to say if it's the next two years or seven years, but uh, it's better monitoring, um, but are not panicking for that. It's just a challenge uh, here in the West. I think we need to learn a lot with, uh, with China and their progress. It's um, uh, at this stage, it's better paying attention on the indicators that uh, show that growth will or is stabilizing and probably uh, it will not be a source of destabilization uh, for 2019. Um, having said that and uh, moving to US, which is less uh, uh, dependent of uh, international trade. It's much more of an uh, internal market economy like the big countries with the exception of China. Uh, I think situation is better than what we had end of last year. Uh, uh, and what happened? Remember, we had the big volatility and uh, uh, a small panic, I would say, in financial markets, basically uh, for fears of a big recession. Uh, we also think this was exaggerated. Markets uh, kind of recovered from the correction of, uh, of last year, 
But more important than that, I think what we are seeing in the US is some moderate uh, 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 growth and uh, some sort of uh, provoked reduction on growth. Remember, US moved interest rates from um, something around zero to something around 3%. So what we are seeing is natural monetary policy effects, expected, more than expected, desired. Probably um, beginning of last year, 12 months ago, we were discussing the risks of uh, some sort of overheat in US economy. And uh, financially speaking, uh, the key fear for the markets uh, was if the Fed, the, the US central bank, was behind the curve, as economists like to say, as some of uh, the brilliant economists here in the audience like to say, um, which are real risks for financial markets. This is not good news. Um, uh, be sure that um, some moderate growth with moderate interest rates, like we are seeing now, I think it's much, much better and much less uh, riskier than if we were worried about uh, overheat and eventually some uh, unexpected height, hike in U.S. interest rates. Uh, this is by far uh, the most important uh, variable for emerging markets. Um, the, you can trust me on that. Every time that you have an expected and relevant hike in U.S. rates, change the cost of opportunity of the world, financially speaking. And this is uh, generally uh, exponential, uh, brings exponential effects for emerging markets. So uh, uh, having done this uh, uh, quick and brief introduction, uh, I would conclude saying that uh, we have a positive scenario for emerging markets in 19. Uh, uh, we don't see big difference in uh, uh, or big moves in terms of uh, the cost of uh, capital around the world. We don't see big volatility coming, uh, uh, at least in the next uh, uh, months or during this year, which is generally uh, 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 fertile land for uh, investments in uh, our region. So I will stop here and uh, to explore these good opportunities, I invite uh, Will Landers, our partner and head of equities, to discuss that with you. Once again, thank you very much for the presence uh, in our conference. Thank you. Will. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I joined VTG about a month and a half ago uh, after spending uh, 17 years at BlackRock, and I couldn't be more excited to be here, uh, especially given our, our prospects that we're seeing for Latin America and being part of an organization that is 100% focused on uh, providing clients opportunities in Latin America. I think just to put it into perspective um, how we, we show um, the the landscape for international investors, folks that don't really know the region as well as all of us here in the room do. Uh, you know, you look at the population of, of Latin America, we're talking about the population that's very similar to the European Union. You look at the GDP opportunities, we're talking about trillions of dollars. Uh, and you look at the market cap for the different countries, um, and you look at Brazil, almost a trillion dollars. But then you put that in perspective in terms of why does, you know, we'll see later on the positioning of international investors. Um, why is it so small? Well, when we look at Brazil at $950 billion uh, in market cap for the equity market, that's the same as Apple, one company. When we look at Mexico, it's the same as JP Morgan, more or less. When we look at Chile, we're talking about the same thing as Walmart. And Apple trades more in a day than all of our markets to together. So obviously, there's a great opportunity here uh, for these markets to grow, to become more relevant. Uh, but the story has to be a good one because otherwise investors can just look elsewhere and decide, you know what, I don't need to look at Latin America. Uh, things are complicated, uh, and they have been for a long time. Uh, but I think that we're in the cusp of change. Uh, and when you look at these numbers, you can see that, you know, things are very good here in Chile. They're very stable. It's, it's quite a quasi-developed uh, country already uh, by the standards of, of the rating agencies. But we need Brazil to work, you know, for Latin America as an asset class to work. Without Brazil, the other countries combined, unfortunately, don't have enough liquidity, don't have enough depth in the market. Things are changing. We're seeing new listings and, and new companies come into the market, and, and it's great because we do need more of that. Uh, but for this story, this Latin America as an asset class to work, we need Brazil to work. 
Uh, and we've been hearing a lot about positioning and about what investors are looking for. Uh, and some investors have started to put money uh, to work uh, in Latin America. You can see that flows have improved somewhat uh, over the last year. Uh, from a Latin American perspective, accumulated bases uh, that have been improving. Um, and, but when you look deeper and you look at the positioning, and again, when you look at the positioning of global emerging markets, and forget global funds, global funds are not investing here yet. But when you look at global emerging markets funds, we are one of the lowest uh, positionings that they've had uh, over the last uh, five years. And if you can go back further, it's even, even lower than that. And even from a Latin American perspective, when you look at the Brazil's position within LATAM, it's, it's pretty much close to neutral. And the reason for that is that funds like the ones that I've run for the last two decades and will be running here at BTG, actively manage funds, they haven't still attracted a lot of money. Most of the money has been coming through passive portfolios because investors don't want to uh, they, they just want to start to invest uh, in these markets because they're starting to see things improve, but they're still not big believers, so they put their money into a, a passive fund, and if they have to get out, they can get out very quickly. So wh why, why are we excited? Why do we think Brazil is a good story? There's one big reform that we, everybody's been talking about uh, for the last three years. We almost got it done in 2017, but then there was uh, a conversation that shouldn't have happened that became public, and then you derail the whole story, and it's pension reform. And why is pension reform so important in Brazil? When you look at the chart on the left, uh, you can see that Brazil spends as much on, as a percentage of GDP in pensions as most developed countries in, in Europe. But it's got one of the youngest populations still. So I think the exciting part is that when we look at the population in Latin America that's similar to the population uh, of, of Europe, we still have a very young population. It's not as young as it was 20 years ago, obviously, but it's still young, so we still have that uh, demographic uh, dividend to, to, to benefit from. But the fact is when we look at Brazil and we look at what Brazil is spending uh, in terms of its um, in pension in pensions, it's already spending almost 14% of GDP. Same as Greece, France, Portugal, uh, even more than Japan. And that's obviously not sustainable. Um, what the government, the previous government did, and I think when there was an impeachment in Brazil and the, the President Temer, Vice President Temer took over and brought in a very strong finance team. They fixed the accounts in the short term. They passed certain reforms uh, that helped fix the accounts in the short term. And you can see the improvements that we saw, we see in the current account balance uh, over the last couple of years. But without pension reform, the mil, you know, you look at the midterm, things are gonna, are gonna improve. That's gonna continue to grow. Uh, and when you look at how much the government spends already as a percentage of its budget, it's almost half of the budget. 43% of the budget is spent on Social Security. And that number is going to continue to grow if there's no reform. The problem is, is that they did pass a reform which says expenses can go up more than last year's inflation. So as reforms continue to grow more and more, the rest of the stuff, which is the stuff that really has a positive impact on growth and productivity, uh, makes politicians happy about building um, bridges, hospitals, investing in education and healthcare, less and less money is available for that. So this is why there's really no plan B that works if pension reform doesn't work because that 43% was half of that 10 years ago and it's gonna to continue to grow exponentially and everything else is just gonna get squeezed. Um, and primary, as you can see, expenditures going up. I mean, it, the math just doesn't work. So we do believe that reform is gonna go through. We have an important vote today, but there's gonna be a ton of important votes over the next few months. Uh, hopefully by August, September, something like that, we'll have the first vote in Congress. And then finally, we'll have uh, this pension reform moving in a way that will be good enough, it won't be perfect, but it will be good enough so that we can focus on other things and focus on other opportunities that the Brazilian economy has. Uh, and a lot of the numbers that the minister just showed showing GDP forecasts being lower than they were for the region overall comes because Brazilian GDP is expected, was expected to be closer to two. Now we're talking about a number that's gonna be below one and a half, possibly closer to 1%. Um, and when you look at what's available, like look at the pent up demand for everything, when you look at what this economy could be doing, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Unemployment has started to improve uh, with the changes done by the previous administration and continue now uh, by the current administration, uh, but it's still at very high levels. When you look at capacitization, very low levels. Uh, so with that, inflation is very much under control. Uh, and as we know, and really what caused the Dillman administration to eventually fall was that inflation went back into the double digits uh, during her administration, and that is the worst thing that can happen to any of our economies, but especially an economy like Brazil. So with inflation under control, you know, my expectation, I think a lot of our expectations is that when, spe when special reform is done, the central bank's got room to cut rates. You know, inflation is running around 3.5%. 
rates are 6.5% right now, which is the lowest we've had, uh, I think, in most of our careers. But it's still a 3% real rate, which is maybe close to neutral now. And if you want to give a little strength, you know, you know, allow this economy to start growing at a faster rate, you have room to cut it, at least temporarily, 100 bips, whatever, whatever it is. And that's going to have another positive impact on economic growth. It's going to have a imp positive impact on demand for equities. So there's a virtuous circle that this thing can, can unravel. Now, Plan B, in my opinion, and Laura, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but Plan B does not exist. Plan B is all these things, all, all the, every uh, asset in Brazil's price wrong. The real won't be four, it will be five, it will be six, who the heck knows. Inflation is going to be higher. Interest rates are going to have to go up. Unemployment is not going to be 12, it's going to be mid-teens, high-teens. It's a disaster for everybody. And the good news for us is, as investors is that politicians in Brazilia know this. So they're going to continue this in fighting to try to gain some advantages or see, look, I did this, I did that, and that's going to happen. But the reform has to go through because Plan B is not good for anybody, including the opposition that's fighting. But really, I think at the end of the day, some of them will come through uh, with a vote. And when we look at Brazil, similar to the comment that I made about the United States, Brazil also is an economy that's really much more about the domestic side of the equation. It's getting that domestic side right, then everything else will work. Brazil only exports 13% of GDP. It's a number that's very similar to the United States. So when we talk about what caused the, the recession in Brazil and all that, it wasn't global trade, it wasn't currency wars, it wasn't China, it wasn't, it was, it was really problems from the previous administration that are being started to be fixed uh, once we had the impeachment, and now we have an administration that has an economic team that's focused on getting the economy going again, reducing the size of government, making Brazil much more efficient, and a much more attractive place to invest. Even with rules that weren't so great, Brazil was attracting pretty good investments, as you can see the FDI numbers here. But the opportunity is for these numbers to be much bigger, given the size of the economy uh, and, and the young population. And, and we saw in the, late, in the first decade of this century when 40 million Brazilians ascended into the middle class and the economy was booming. Unfortunately, then uh, the PT administration lost focus and, and things got der derailed a little bit. And then when we look at the equity market, which is more in my world, and you look at the allocations that local investors have, we'll talk about foreign investors in a second, but when we look at the allocation that local investors have to equities, it's about 10% of overall portfolios. It's half of what it was in 2017, 2007, 07, 08, when Brazil for a little while was upgraded to investment grade and rates had gone down to seven and a quarter percent, which was the lowest ever at that point, but didn't stay there very long. So there wasn't enough time for, those, for, the, for that money to really stay invested in equities, and eventually it went back into fixed income. And if you think about it, three years ago, more or less, uh, a Brazilian a, a, a pension fund could buy an inflation-linked bond at inflation plus seven percent, and why would you buy anything else? It was a 20-year bond at inflation plus seven, and your actuarial needs were six, six and a half. So you buy that bond, and then you go to the beach, play volleyball, do something else. But you don't have to worry about equities. You don't have to worry about doing any type of analysis uh, into your portfolio. Things are different now. Rates are six and a half. If, the, if not, when the reform passes, they're likely to come down a little bit more. So in that environment, I think equities are going to become a much more needed uh, tool or a destination for local uh, investors, both institutional as well as retail. Uh, and that number should and will go much higher. So that's one side. It's the local investor coming into the Brazilian market. And then when we look at, and sorry, there's a lot of little numbers here, but when you look at the allocation that foreign investors have and what they have had in the past and what this could mean, we're talking about at least $50 billion uh, in investments that could come in from investors if they just go back to a level of 2014. And 2014 was when, when uh, you know, it wasn't particularly a great moment for Brazil, but it was a moment where there was a lot of hope with the, ele with the election and all that. In other periods, there were even higher allocations to Brazilian equities. So I think that the, po the point here is that we have the potential for this economy to grow three, three and a half percent in, in a year or two years' time. Uh, a, a lot of no inflationary pressures coming from the industrial side, from the employment, uh, rates staying lower, local investors as well as global investors very much underweighted equities versus what they've had in the past. So there's a big opportunity here, and then we do think that once this reform gets done, uh, people are on hold. Investors are on hold. Companies are on hold. Everybody's on hold waiting for this to happen because, as I mentioned, if the reform doesn't go through, then everything is priced in, in a wrong level. But once it does, I do think that there is a room for the, strength, the currency to strength a little bit and money start to come back even uh, bigger into the country. 
and then eventually this, this flow into equities, which is not going to be overnight, obviously, but it's going to be something that should be sustainable. So we get into this virtuous circle that could last uh, years and not just quarters. And, and, and that's why I think for investors looking to invest in Latin America, uh, looking to invest in Brazil, this is, this is a, a, a great time to look at it. Clearly, there are risks there, so it's not a, a one-way street. But we do think that there is uh, great support for this important reform to go through. And then there's other things that, that will come behind it. Uh, you know, the, the, the plan to privatize and reduce the size of government and sell assets, it's also a, a very large uh, program. And that money is going to go straight to pay down debt. So that, again, making Brazil a much safer, lower risk country, which, by the way, is good for equities because lower risk premium means uh, higher valuations, even with a sim similar growth. And then if you have higher growth and lower risk, it should be a, a pretty good environment to be invested in equities. So when we look at, when we look at our portfolios, when we look at how we want to position a Latin American portfolio today, I mean, Brazil is definitely going to be an important part of that portfolio. It's going to be a big overweight for us. Uh, across several sectors, and it's an area where uh, the team is very much focused on, on, on finding the best opportunities for this time, but also see what's going to work over the next year plus. When we look at Mexico, um, and if we think about the political landscape uh, in Latin America uh, and the many elections that we had over the last uh, two or three years, virtually every country in the region, especially, well, let's say every country in South America that had a true democratic election um, had a shift to the right of center from the previous administration. We can say that about Brazil, about Argentina, about Chile. Colombia stayed where it was. Uh, obviously, some other countries that I wouldn't consider investable from an equities perspective uh, haven't done so, like Venezuela. Uh, but the countries that we care about did. That one exception is Mexico, where uh, there was a, de a definitive shift uh, to the left with the election of, of Lopez Obrador. Mexico's been actually one of the better performing markets so far this year because I think there were so many fears about what Lopez Obrador was going to do with this supermajority that he has uh, gained in Congress. I think, which was really the big surprise. Not only did he win a victory, a smashing victory in the first round of the election in Mexico, but he also took control of Congress in a bigger way than people expected. And in Mexico, for you to be able to do constitutional reforms, you need to have two-thirds vote in Congress plus more than half of the state Congresses. And he pretty much has that. So far, he hasn't taken that, that, that car for a ride yet and see what he can do with it. Uh, but I think there is definitely concern that at some point that could happen, so folks are paying attention. But when you look at what we're looking at in terms of Mexican growth, Mexico has been stuck in this 2% plus or minus a couple of basis points growth for a long time. The big reform that President Peña Neto passed in the previous administration was opening up the oil sector. Uh, and there were numbers that showed that if oil investments picked up, Mexico could grow four, five, six percent, some people were talking about. Unfortunately for Mexico, as soon as they opened up the sector, the oil price came down significantly, so the interest in, in investing there didn't come through. And now Lopez Obrador has put that to a halt, no more auctions. Uh, and uh, so Pemex is going to continue to be the, the, the leader in terms of investments uh, in, in oil in Mexico, which is going to limit, uh, I think, this growth. So I think. Best case scenario is that we're stuck in this 2% growth, which is not great, but it's good enough for a lot of the, the private sector. So the consumer side of the economy uh, continues to do better than that. It's really the government side and the oil side that's a drag, which are similar numbers, I think, than what we saw um, in terms of what the minister showed here for Chile, but obviously on a smaller scale. And when you look at the companies in, in Mexico, they do have exposure to the foreign market. You know, free trade agreements is obviously very important. If you remember that slide that I showed in terms of percentage of exports and GDP, Brazil was 13, Mexico is 38 percent. So Mexico is much more dependent on global trade, but it's actually not global trade; it's U.S. trade. It's you know the, with NAFTA and now the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement um, that accounts for 85, 90 percent of Mexican exports. And it looks like we're moving in the right direction, and we have an agreement on that. We still have to get approval from all the different congresses and. Uh, uh, I don't think, uh, despite everything being okay in the United States, I don't think the Congress in the United States is willing to give President Trump uh, any, any victories or apparent victories or even anything close to that. So I don't, I'm not sure when that thing is actually going to get voted. But in the meantime, it's business as usual, and Mexico, the exporting part of Mexico continues to grow uh, very fast. Um, and you can see there, light vehicles exports in Mexico uh, at an all-time record. Um, and, that's, and really, the, the being driven by this uh, manufacturing labor costs benefit that Mexico has uh, over China and, and also over the United States. But I think this is one of the reasons why Lopez Obrador was elected. Is when you look at these figures here, you can see that uh, Mexico has become more competitive uh, than China in terms of labor costs by keeping 
labor costs flat, meaning that wages haven't gone up. Uh, different from many other countries in here in South America, there has been no growth uh, in Mexico's middle class during the last 20 years, or very little growth. And this is why they finally had enough and, and elected a president that has this populist policies uh, that supposedly is going to help uh, those segments of the population. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we haven't seen any examples in the world where populism eventually leads to uh, a greater wealth distribution. Uh, so um, that's why I, I wouldn't be too, too optimistic on that. One of the things driving um, the consumption in Mexico, though, is somewhat linked to what Andrea was talking about, which is the U.S. economy doing well. Mexican Americans continue to send more and more money uh, to Mexico, and you can see that uh, it's, all, it's over $2 billion a month of remittances, and that number is growing. And it's almost a, a buffer against any uh, devaluation of the currency, because obviously in, in pesos then, if the currency devalued, that these folks are getting even more money, and that money is going straight to the economy. So when we look at Mexico today from a portfolio perspective, I, I wouldn't say we are an overweight. I think we do have concerns, especially given the rally that we've seen in, in the last few weeks. But there are definitely opportunities to invest uh, in the country, uh, both in terms of some sectors that are somewhat related to the manufacturing sector, because unfortunately a lot of this is controlled by uh, international companies, by multinational companies, but also being closer to the consumer, because I do think that there is going to be, at least in the short term, a benefit to the consumer from some of Lopez Obrador's policies. Whether they're sustainable or not, we'll have to, to wait and see. I'm not going to spend too much time on Chile. Um, clearly, the question that I put here is wrong, given the presentation that we just saw before. Is, is Chile decelerating or not? Uh, but we do see some signs of it in some of the numbers, but at the end of the day, I think it's from higher levels, so it's still one of the more uh, dynamic uh, economies that, are, that, are, that we see here in the region. Uh, but one of the positive things that we see is that the corporate sector is very strong. So we have strong companies, uh, well, with, with strong balance sheets, um, a very big focus on profitability, on, you know, despite what the, the graph showed, treating minorities in many cases uh, in, in a good way. Uh, so we see stable results here. So it's a country that um, valuations are never cheap, but I think that they, they, they do show some attractiveness. Um, you don't have to worry about any corporate blowups or anything like that like you may have in some other countries. So um, we, we do have a positive view on Chile, but it's a question of stock picking, valuation, and, and frankly liquidity too, because despite having uh, a $300 billion market cap, when you look at what's actually traded, uh, in the Chilean market, uh, you know, you do only have uh, 12, 15 companies that, to pick from that trade more than $5 million a day uh, at this point. So it'd be great to see more companies listed to give us more opportunities. Not that I'm making an advertisement for, for our work in the investment bank, but happy to see that happen. Uh, because we do think that uh, the countries in the Andean region, not just Chile, but Colombia and Peru, uh, we need to see a greater participation of the, uh, of the economy in, 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 in the stock market so we can have uh, the ability to invest uh, with more confidence, uh, both in terms of getting in, but also getting out uh, from a liquidity perspective. Colombia has been the best performing market so far this year, uh, helped by uh, an economy that is improving. It's finally assimilated uh, the, the tax uh, reforms that happened over the previous years. Obviously, oil prices have helped some as well. Uh, but as we can see in the next slide, it's lot, a lot less dependent on oil than it had been in the past. Um, and it's, it's one where, uh, you know, the budgetary concerns that, that had gone into the election of President Duque have, have subsided. So the, economy, the, the budget is actually in better shape. Again, helped uh, by oil, but also helped by, by faster growth than, than we had seen before. Um, so it's, it's a place where I do think that from a valuation perspective, it's gotten ahead of itself a little bit. It is a market that doesn't have a lot of uh, stocks that one can invest in. But it's one where uh, the previous administration, the current administration, have done a great job in terms of reducing the risks associated with being dependent on oil, uh, diversifying the revenue streams uh, at the government level, uh, and allowing then the economy to start uh, to grow in, in a bigger way. And it is one of those countries, too, where you, especially when you look at the financial sector, the banks have been very aggressive about investing outside of Colombia, so you get uh, a, a bit of exposure that's beyond just what you're getting uh, out of the Colombian side. And just a quick uh, couple of comments on, on the oil sector. Uh, when you can see here, the dependency on oil has come down significantly. The, percent, the oil as a percentage of GDP uh, is it's not as huge, not an uh, important number anymore. Uh, so when we, and it is becoming even lesser important in terms of FDI. So uh, part of the problem is because, uh, as we know, like a petroleum companies like that don't have a lot of um, reserves. So they, they were forced to diversify. 
But you have to give, give credit where credit is due, and they were able to do that and to do that in a, in a very good way. Last country with slides on is Peru. Peru uh, was always, uh, for the last 10 years, for me, the best of the smaller markets in terms of the opportunities. But unfortunately, they got caught up uh, with the scandals that hit the construction companies in Brazil. They imported that uh, in a big way and caused a big uh, uh, problem there for in terms of for the political side as well as growth. Uh, but they're finally starting to recover. Uh, and, and we're definitely thinking, we're looking at Peru now with, with, with better eyes. Uh, mining sector has been uh, a, a major source of growth, but what you do need to see is the infrastructure sector picking up uh, in, in a bigger way. Finally, uh, I don't have any slides, and no offense if any Argentines in, in the audience, but Argentina has, has been one of these markets where uh, there's been opportunities for alpha generation, but a lot of question marks, and I think today there's a lot more questions than answers uh, in terms of what's happening there. So uh, I don't foresee us having much exposure to Argentina at this point in our fund. Uh, and I do have a concern that if MSCI over the last two years decided that we're not going to upgrade Argentina, or I hate the word upgrade, we're not going to reclassify Argentina to investment to emerging markets because uh, we were concerned about the politics there. I think the politics now are a little trickier than they were last year and definitely two years ago. So it's, it's not the, the base case, but I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to take another year. Let's go through the election and then we can make this a reclassification next year. Argentina definitely has a liquidity, uh, a lot of ADRs, so it, it's a, it's an inter and it's a cheap market uh, if we believe things are going to get better, but I'm not sure that things are going to get better uh, soon. They may get worse before they get better, so I think uh, uh, the opportunity may be a little later on. But that's what I had. Again, thanks very much for your time. Uh, and when we, when we come back, or? Please. Thank you. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, a continuación, vamos a cambiar de tema y es mi turno para introducir a Salim Ismail. Salim es un hombre comprometido con el mundo del emprendimiento, la innovación y la tecnología. Es un reconocido estratega digital, ingeniero informático y exitoso emprendedor tecnológico. Y además, autor de un bestseller, Organizaciones Exponenciales. Salim está constantemente viajando alrededor del mundo para compartir sus ideas y experiencias en la introducción de nuevas tecnologías, tecnologías disruptivas, asesorando empresas para que se puedan convertir en organizaciones exponenciales que cambian al, al ritmo de estas tecnologías. Durante los últimos 10 años, Salim ha estado involucrado en el proyecto Singularity University, una incubadora de empresas tecnológicas en Silicon Valley, primero como su director ejecutivo y actualmente como su embajador global. El objetivo de esta universidad es educar y empoderar una nueva generación de líderes para que usen estas nuevas tecnologías para resolver algunos de los desafíos más apremiantes que enfrenta la humanidad en áreas como salud, educación, medio ambiente y energía. También es director de XPRIZE, una organización dedicada a incentivar la inversión en investigación y desarrollo que entrega premios millonarios a quienes logran resolver desafíos tecnológicos muy concretos. Algunos, como hemos visto, llevar eh, en vuelos comerciales el hombre al espacio, crear eh, vehículos eh, super eficientes, la limpieza de los océanos, eh, tecnologías médicas. Así que vamos a hablar de una gama, gama muy variada de temas. Y Salim, además, es un gran comunicador. Algunos de nosotros tuvimos la oportunidad de verlo el año pasado en Nueva York durante nuestra conferencia eh, CEO Conference en Nueva York y, y vimos, pudimos ver de primera mano sus cualidades como comunicador. Eso sí, habla muy rápido. Eh, así que en su presentación manténgase atento porque van a salir muchas ideas eh, y con eso quiero dejar con ustedes a Salim Isma Ismail. Salim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Buenos días. That's all the Spanish I know, uh, unfortunately, so I, I need a few drinks, uh, some pisco sour, and then it gets a lot better. Uh, so I'm going to run through uh, three pieces of this, of this talk. Uh, the first is what's the underlying basis of what, the disruption that we're seeing today. 
Uh, we're seeing very disruptive changes across our society. And why is that happening? Uh, the second is what's the implications of that, both for business, uh, but also for society in general. And then third, most importantly, what can you do about it? How do you adapt uh, to this world? Um, how, how many of you are familiar with Singularity University? Can I just see a show of hands? OK, a bunch of you. Excellent. All right. So I'm actually Canadian, uh, originally from India. I spent 10 years in Europe restructuring large European organizations, many French companies, which is why I'm bold, and if that may make sense to some of you. Um, and I've been building out Singularity University for about 10 years now. Uh, and, but my journey starts uh, 12 years ago when I was the head of innovation at Yahoo, uh, running their incubator. And I learned a really fundamental lesson there, which is when you try disruptive innovation in any legacy environment, the immune system attacks you. Right? Because all of our organizations are built to resist change and, and withstand risk. And yet that's now the high order bit. And how do you deal with that is one of the central problems I've been dealing with the last few years. Uh, how do you solve this immune system problem? Because we have it in all of our companies, but we also have that in the public sector. You know, if you try and update education, the teachers go crazy. You try and update uh, transportation, you have the fight between Uber and the taxis. So almost all my work now these last few years is how do you solve the immune system response when we try anything very new? Um, probably the strangest phone call I've received was last year from the Vatican. Uh, saying, look, the Pope has the oldest immune system in the world. It's 2,000 years old, and can we talk to you? And I've actually run some workshops there which, with some interesting uh, results. Um, our, our journey really starts here with this graph that Ray Kurzweil put together. Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis are the two main founders of Singularity. And he went, Ray put this chart together of Moore's Law, the idea that we double every 18 months computational capability. And he went all the way back to 1900 and finds that we have been doubling computational power for more than 100 years, way before Gordon Moore made his predictions. And the question that he asked when he saw this data is why is this curve so smooth and so predictable? We've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the industry. You should expect a very jagged stock market type of shape, but this is incredibly predictable and steady. And he spent a full 10 years trying to understand this. Why is this so uh, smooth and predictable? And he came up with a very fundamental observation that now drives most of our thinking, which is once you take any domain, discipline, industry area, product area, you power it with information technologies, and it acquires informational flow properties, the price performance starts doubling. And most importantly, once that doubling pattern starts, it does not stop. It just keeps going. And cognitively, that's very hard for us to understand. If you look at the technologies, if you can read these labels, we've had multiple technologies in computation, vacuum tubes, transistors, integrated circuits, and so on. You can think of each one as kind of an S-curve, where technology takes off, accelerates, reaches its upper limits. But if you have an information-based environment, something else always takes over the curve. And so we've seen this five times in a row, and we're actually reaching the end of the life cycle of integrated circuits. The chips are getting very hot down at the surface levels. We're down to a few nanometers of wire thickness. But now we have several technologies clustered at the edge, ready to take it to the next level. Uh, 3D chip design, optical computing, quantum computing, et cetera. Uh, probably quantum computing is the most likely candidate uh, that really requires a lot of alcohol to discuss, so I, I won't get into it here. Um, and so this fundamental pattern led Peter uh, Diamandis, the founder of Singularity and the, the founder of also the XPRIZE, to write this book, Abundance. And he charts out in, in this book that if we can harness this acceleration and leverage it, we will soon have an abundance of healthcare, education, clean water, energy in about a decade. And what does the world look like if that's the case? Um, many of you know the XPRAS Foundation, which gives large public prizes wherever there are market failures. I joined the board last year with some very interesting characters on it. 
uh, pretty much every board meeting now starts with, uh, you know, what did Elon just do? And then we move on to the rest of the business uh, of the day. But XPRIZE has been very successful in giving large prizes to solve problems. The Space X Prize has led to the commercialization of space with Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, and all the nanosatellite companies. Uh, this one was an incredibly huge achievement that came out a few months ago, the Clean Water Extraction Prize. And the prize was, can you create a machine that will extract out of the atmosphere 2,000 liters of water per day using only renewable energy for less than two cents a liter? Okay, that's an incredible uh, concept. Two cents a liter for, to feed a village, et cetera. Uh, we offered this prize a few years ago, $3 million prize. And in October, we awarded this prize. So we now have a machine that can extract clean water out of the atmosphere at less than two cents a liter. This is unbelievable. When you commercialize this and you have clean water in most parts of the world, uh, clean water means you take out half of the diseases in the world. And so the ripple effects become very profound once that happens. Um, and at Singularity, the really the core thinking there is that that doubling pattern that we've seen in computation, that we've lived through all of our devices, we're now seeing that doubling pattern in a dozen technologies. And this is completely unique. In the history of mankind, at any given point, you had maybe one technology accelerating or another. Never have we had this many all at the same time. In, uh, in neuroscience, the resolution at which we can image the brain is doubling every year. Um, in uh, biotech, we're sequencing the human genome. We're doubling that every five months. That may be the fastest moving technology we've ever seen. And cognitively, we have a very, very difficult time getting our hands around this. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you had heard of 3D printing five years ago? Can I just see a show of hands? Quite a few of you, hopefully, five years. Okay, 10 years ago? Anybody? 15 years ago? So 3D printing is 35 years old. It is not new. But when it first came out in the early 80s, the capability was terrible. You could, you could print out 0.001 widgets per hour. Uh, two years later, it doubled to 0.002 widgets per hour. Two years later, it doubled again to 0.004. Two years later, 0.008. And for a long time, it looks like zero. Right? Then it hits the knee of the curve, and it gets to 0.1, 0.2, 0.4, 0.8, 1 1.6. And sure enough, then we call it a black swan. So we found that if you do not spot these doubling patterns early, they disrupt you very badly. If you can spot them early, it's the biggest advantage you could possibly have. And that's maybe the heart of the uh, uh, in, uh, disruption there. When we apply these to industries, we tend to see these things in three layers. The vast majority of our history uh, is, a, is the sheer physicality of the world. We extract resources, we assemble raw materials, we move things around. And almost all of the revenue generation, value creation, business models comes from this layer, right? Then we added products like the Kindle or the iPhone, where the product is physical, but all the revenue is digitally driven, information based. And with the rise of mobile and internet, we now have entire industries that are completely digital with very little physical manifestation at all. I, and now we're starting to see things flip around. We're moving more and more industries up this stack. I write in the book that the Tesla is not really a car with computers and sensors in it. It's a computer with wheels. And you look at it very differently when you look at it from that, that perspective. Uh, actually, one of our alumni corrected me and said, you're wrong about that. Remember that the Tesla updates itself every few weeks. You have to think of it as an app that has wheels, right? which sounds ridiculous, but it's clearly the directionality is correct. So with all of these technologies moving very quickly, we're seeing four major things happen in the world today. The first is very obvious. We're digitizing the world very, very rapidly. Our memories aren't in our heads anymore. They're in our smartphones. All our relationships are now digital as opposed to analog. 10 years ago, we had maybe half a billion internet connected devices in the world. We're up to about 20 billion today. But this is doubling every year. And very quickly, we'll get to a trillion because we'll go from 50 to 100 to 200 to 400 to 800, et cetera. Think of that one statistic, 20 billion today going to a trillion. We think we're 30, 40, 50 years into the information revolution. On this metric, we're at 2%. We're just starting. 
We do all, most of this disruption is ahead of us as opposed to behind us, and we're now digitizing more and more very bizarre domains. This team out of Israel can take 10 seconds of your voice, and just by analyzing the tone, the variation in the tone, they can assess your mood and your attitude to an 85% accuracy. Customer service teams are using this today. If an angry customer calls, what's the underlying attitude? You know, can, you, can you save the account or should you just hang up the phone and move on to the next one? How do you think about that? You can actually download this app called Moody's if you want to try this out on yourself. Um, try this out on your spouse if you want to have an interesting discussion about their mood. <laughs> that one does not go very well, by the way. And it starts to get very weird. I was speaking at one of our conferences recently, and while I was on stage, one of our alumni taped 13 seconds of my voice, and he showed the results to the audience. So that was my mood and my attitude as I was speaking on stage, which gets very, very uh, uncomfortable. Um, and of course, he's totally wrong about the stubbornness. I'm not stubborn at all. You see how kind of weird this gets, right? And, and we found that when you digitize, things become very, very disruptive. And the best uh, analogy and framing we have found for that is photography. Uh, the, really the transition from film photography to digital photography. When you're operating in film photography, you're operating from a scarcity model, right? You can only carry so much film, costs about a dollar a photograph, takes some days to get your prints back. You move to digital photography, you move to the information-based environment, three fundamentally important things happen. First, marginal cost goes to zero. That's pretty interesting, right? Now I can take a thousand photographs and the cost does not change. As a result of that, the domain completely explodes. In film photography, I'm very carefully clicking here, carefully clicking there. Today we're holding the button down on all of our devices and taking billions of times more photographs because the cost is gone. Right? But the third thing that's very subtle but very important from a business perspective is you shift the problem space. So in a scarcity problem space, I, I have a whole set of business models around that scarcity. I, people sell very expensive cameras. I may offer courses in photography. I may publish books on composition. And there's all this way of making money to op help people optimize for that scarcity. But you move to the digital environment, and the problem we have with digital photography today is not a scarcity problem. The problem we have is we have eight copies of our photographs on 10 devices, and you can't find anything. Right? You've gone from a sourcing problem to a filtering problem. More importantly, nobody can make money offering courses on photography today. Right? And this underlying pattern where the problem space shifts, now note that the incumbents are still optimized for the scarcity material physical view of the world, and the underlying foundation has changed. And this transition we're seeing in all of these technologies. They're all going through this transition in a fundamental way. Uh, here's one way I like to frame it. Here's a 700-year look at the cost of light. It used to be very expensive to light up a building or a room. Um, you needed torches and so on. Then we invented candle technology and plateaus for a while. And then we find electricity and we industrialize it and it crashes to near zero. And what's interesting here is the shape of the curve. Uh, very expensive plateaus crashes to near zero. Because here's the same shape of the curve in DNA sequencing. Very expensive plateaus crashes to near zero. Here's the same shape of the curve in solar energy. And in technology after technology, the cost is crashing to zero or near zero. And what's very unique today, again, is that in the past, in the history of mankind, new advanced technologies cost a lot. And today, very, very uniquely, new advanced technologies don't cost very much. The tools that we use to navigate AI are mostly free. The blockchain is open source and free. And drones, biotech, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all very, very inexpensive. So this totally changed the game in how we think about it. In artificial intelligence, the vast majority has been how do we augment existing applications. The reason we use AI is we've not had an upgrade in our brains in about 50,000 years. If, if your iPhone was 50,000 years old, you would be very unhappy with it. We have a lot of old biases. We have very limited bandwidth. Here are some of the biases and heuristics in, in cognition, and we struggle with these. We have sunk cost bias and framing bias and positivity bias and so on. Uh, here's a study of parole hearings. Should you let a prisoner out from jail or not? It turns out if you came up for parole just before lunch and the judges were hungry, you're going back to jail. 
right? If you came up just after lunch and they were biologically happier because they've eaten, 30% more likely that you go free, right? So the, here's a food bias. And now because of data analytics, we can find these patterns and fix them, right? Before we could not find them. And now we can apply AI to all sorts of data streams coming around. When you take AI and you put it into things that move, you have robotics. We're all familiar with the $20 helicopters that all the kids are playing with. Eight or nine years ago, that cost $700. And about 12 years ago, that was not possible. So something that wasn't possible 12 years ago, the miniaturization, the stabilizers, et cetera, we now throw it away in a toy. Right? And just as an example, if you go back on YouTube and look at a talk or two that I did say in 2013, you'll hear me say that a drone can carry a 20 kilo package about 10 kilometers. But these are doubling every nine months in their price performance. And sure enough, we went from 20 to 40 to 80 to 160 to 320. And exactly on time, Boeing's new drone can carry 600 kilos. More importantly, in another nine months, it's 1,200 kilos. And another nine months, it's 2,400 kilos. Because that doubling pattern doesn't stop. And now we have really interesting parking applications where we'll just pick up a car and move it when we need to, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But, but for sure, the biggest disruption that we're going to see, certainly in our careers, is going to be solar energy. Because solar energy is doubling every 22 months in its capability. It's riding this exponential curve. And if you can see the numbers, it's been doing this for 40 years. So for 40 years, we've been doubling the price performance of solar every two years, uh, like clockwork. At this pace, we will be able to deliver 100% of world energy supply with solar in 12 years. We are six doublings away from being able to deliver all of our solar needs globally. This totally changes global geopolitics, right? The Middle East collapses. The US has to find other reasons to go to war. Uh, all sorts of interesting side effects happen as a result of that. Here's the relative cost of solar to other fuels. You can see the unbelievable multiplier over the last few decades as the price has crashed. And I showed you this graph already. Two very important things about this. First, let's remember that that doubling pattern doesn't stop. So if we can deliver 100% of global energy supply or our needs in 12 years, and it's doubling every two years, it means in 14 years, we can deliver 200%. In 16 years, we can deliver 400%. In 18 years, we can deliver 800%. And that just keeps going. Right? So energy, which has been scarce for the entire history of humanity, is about to become abundant. And this has enormous implications. The second piece of this is that if you're worried there's not enough solar out there, it turns out if you add up all of our fossil fuel reserves in the whole world, all of the coal and oil and natural gas in the whole world, and add that up, all of that collectively adds up to five days of sunlight hitting the world. So that shifts the conversation instantly from a scarcity problem to a conversion problem. Right? And so huge implications there. Uh, about a quarter of the farms in California are already solar powered. Here in Chile, recently, they were generating so much solar, they were trying to give it away for free. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. And maybe in the ultimate of all ironies that I've been able to find, the coal museum in Kentucky is using solar panels. Uh, and just how do you look in the mirror uh, on this one is, is beyond me. And we see these huge transitions. You see these very weird things happening, right? So solar will take over the world in the next five to 10 years. Just already, it is about half the price of a, a coal-fired plant. About three years ago, a huge inflection point was hit where it made no sense to build a coal or oil-fired plant because solar, a, a new plant, solar was cheaper. But this year, we just hit another milestone. It is now cheaper to build a solar farm than to run an existing coal-fired farm. So now we shut down the coal because it makes no sense. It's cheaper to build a new one from scratch, CapEx, OpEx, all included. Now the big challenge is storage. How are you going to store all this energy? So uh, utilities are pumping water up hills and using hydro at night. Uh, battery technology is lagging behind solar by about five years, but only by about five years. So by about 2024 or so, when solar and storage are the same level of maturity, it means the business model of every electrical utility in the world disappears. Right? Because if you have solar and storage, I don't need a utility. 
So this is enormous implications of, for all sorts of things. So I tried, to, I tried to live this myself. If you're going to talk about this, you have to have some experiential basis for this. So two years ago, I took a Tesla, and I drove from Miami all the way up to Toronto. I would stop at the charging stations. When I got on the highway, I would hit the button for the car to drive itself. The car drove itself about 35% of the time. Okay? When I to, about eight, uh, recently, about a year and a bit ago, I drove it back, 18 months later. Slightly shorter trip, uh, there's a little bit less driving time, uh, two less stops. But look at this bottom row. This is fascinating. When I drove it up, as I said, the car drove itself about 35% of the time. When I drove it back, same car, same sensors, now it's driving itself 80% of the time. And that's better data, better software, that many more cars have gone down the street. And there you see a real-time doubling pattern Moore's law doubling every 18 months right there in the AI, right? Now just think about this for a second. I got into a car, which was basically a first class train cabin, right? It drove me across the country 80% 80 80 of the time by itself. And because the charging stations are free, the entire trip, 2,500 kilometers, cost me zero. It cost me zero to cross the country. Now when we go back and forth, I say to my wife, you fly, I'll drive the car, right? I made like 60 conference calls along the way. I had a ton of fun. Because I'm not driving, I'm much more relaxed. And this is what I call a Gutenberg moment. In the 15th century, the printing press changed the world. And we call that a Gutenberg moment because it changed society. If you think of what was happening today, just solar energy changes the world completely. Then you add in drones, then you add in AI, then you add in biotech, 3D printing, neuroscience breakthroughs. Today we have about 20 Gutenberg moments all hitting, hitting us at the same time. And as a society, we're facing incredible stress because we're not able to absorb this, all this innovation quickly enough. If you think about all the mechanisms we use to run society, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, our healthcare systems, education, intellectual property, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, right? Not for today. Definitely not for the trillion sensors coming down the pike. We actually have to re-architect all of the mechanisms by which we run the world. Uh, our civics and politics are breaking down. Democracy, we invented representative democracies when information was scarce. If you were in Washington, D.C., you had absolutely no idea what was happening in California. The speed of a horse was as fast as you could find out. So you had a representative come across the country two, three times a year and say, here's what my people are thinking. But today we have an abundance of information. It gets misused, misinterpreted, faked, and every major democracy in the world is broken. Right? And we already heard about how the stressed our democracies are. Uh, or you take education. Our education systems are designed to take a young child, train them through their early 20s to be ready for the existing job market. Except we don't know what a job will look like in five years. What are we teaching them? And so we're seeing the stress in all of our institutions, which is why there's so much uncertainty about the world. On a lighter note, you take the institution of marriage. Uh, we invented marriage about 9,000 years ago. And when that first surfaced as a human institution, average lifespan was about 23 years old. So you got married and you had kids and you died. Marriage is not supposed to last 50, 60 years. Um, my, my wife calls that state-sanctioned torture. Uh, um, it, and, so, and we're about to double human lifespan. Right? In the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to double human lifespan. Are you supposed to live with the same person for 120 years? That's crazy. And so we worry about these institutions. We worry about the divorce rate, but it's simply not set up for the time that we live into. And this is why we're seeing enormous stress in the world. Now, how many, if you're feeling a little freaked out by the technology, What's happening is you have a little organ in the back of your brain called an amygdala. It's an evolutionary mechanism that we evolved on the plains of Africa. Uh, it, back then, if you heard a noise in the bushes, you ran, right? because bad news can kill you. Good news doesn't kill you. If I miss a piece of good news, I might miss some fruit that I could eat. If I missed a piece of bad news, I died. So we're actually 10 times more likely to pay attention to bad news than good news. This is, this is why Fox News does very well in, in the US. If you, if you watch Fox News, you're going to die this week, right? 
if you're really lucky, you'll last till next week, but then you're going to die next week. But you're going to die, right? Um, uh, Peter calls CNN the crisis news network, because when you can track every bank robbery in high definition, real time, streamed to 20 devices, you think the world is going to hell. And then you vote based on that, we end up with Trump or Brexit or any of the mess that we're in today. Um, Douglas Adams put this very well. He said, anything in the, born, in the world when you're born, that's normal. Anything invented when you're young, that's a career. Anything invented after you're 35 years old is just wrong. It just shouldn't be, it's just wrong. And I think that highlights pretty well what's happening. Because actually, the world is in an incredibly better place than we've ever had it. Extreme poverty used to be almost 94% of human, humanity lived in extreme poverty. Bill Gates thinks we will eradicate extreme poverty in 12 years. You will not see this in the news because it's good news. Okay? Here's just the last 100 years of, of, of what, what's happened. Unbelievable progress in infant mortality, maternal mortality, the cost of electricity, transportation, communication, all dropping thousands of times. And all of this driven mostly through technology. But now that it's biting and moving so quickly, we're having some enormous effects. I think this is the most relevant one for your audience, the sheer demonetization of it. There are two major things happening on the economy. The first is the metabolism is accelerating. It used to take 20 years to create a billion dollar marketplace. That's now happening in months or even days. But this is the curve I find most interesting. This is the graph of the newspaper business. Uh, it moved along like this, and then we information enabled it and went end to end information based, and boom, a six times drop in revenues within two years as eBay, Craigslist kind of took out the advertising market. Here's the music business, and you see the same cliff. Note here, they're trying to sell the scarcity. They're, they have a scarcity business model selling the physical media. You go to digital music, you go to an abundance model. And everybody crashes. All the revenues leave. A 10x drop in revenues in this industry, in business right now, right? TV Azteca, Globo, others have a huge issue as the money is leaving the system. This cliff, by the way, hits the car industry in about four years. In about four years, we'll, we're going to suddenly stop buying cars uh, because of electricity or Uber or autonomous cars. Um, as a minor note, uh, teenagers in big cities are not getting driver's licenses, right? Most of us were down at the, the driver's license office the day we turned 16 so we could get away from our parents. Um, I guess they Uber away from their parents these days. Um, and so huge implications there. And it's very, very hard to spot this. And I want to spend a couple of minutes on this. If I could have you remember one piece of this presentation, this is it. It's very hard to spot this disruption. And I want to give a couple of examples. When the Google car first came out uh, 10 years ago, the cost of the LIDAR, the GPS, the radar, the sensors added up to about $200,000 per car. And all the car companies looked at that and said, ah, cute research project, but you won't commercialize that. Two years later, it dropped by 50%. It was $100,000 a car. Two years later, it dropped again, another 50%. It was $50,000 a car. And still the response was, who will pay $50,000 for all those sensors? We went from 50 to 25 to 12 to 6 to 3. And we're below $1,000 a car now for all those sensors. Right? This LiDAR unit at the top of this Prius, light radar, that cost $75,000 seven years ago. Anybody know what it is today? Today, that's about $40. Why? Because there's two or three technologies inside it each technology is dropping about 50% a year. The aggregate effect is profound. Right? And if you want an interesting thought experiment, go back seven years ago to the car industry and tell them that this LiDAR unit would cost $40 in seven years, and you'll see the response. Right? They'll say you're crazy. They'll say you've gone mad. You've drunk too much, whatever, whatever. And we're seeing the same discussion with energy companies and solar. You talk to an energy company about solar, they go, it's a joke, can't scale, the storage is a problem, transmission is a problem, regulatory is a problem, et cetera, et cetera. But when the cost gets low enough and becomes near free, you have that effect. By the way, the next version will be $10 and it will dematerialize into our smartphones the way we've seen uh, uh, GPS receivers dematerialize. Here's another example. We saw exponential growth in mobile phones during the decade of the 2000s. 100 million, 200 million, 400 million, 800 million, 1.6 billion. 
Vinod Kosla did an amazing piece of research. He went back through that decade and he asked the question, how well did the mobile industry expert analysts, the Gartners, the Foresters, the Jupiters, the McKinsey's, predict that pace of change? In 2002, we went from 100 to 200 million, and yet the prediction was 16% growth. Why? Because they expected it to level off. Right? It went up another 100%. Their next prediction didn't go up, it went down. They predicted 14% growth. Went up another 100%, their prediction was 12% growth. And you see what's happening here. At every point on this exponential curve, the expert in that industry goes linear. Right? In fact, in 2008, not able to see 300% doublings, they predicted 10% growth. Then it went up another 100%. Now, how much more wrong can you be from 10% to 100%? You should lose your job. Right? This is not a cognitive error, this is, a math, this is not a math error, this is a cognitive error. Let me show you this graph that really, really shows this. So what you see here in the black is the exponential growth in solar energy, growing absolutely up to the right like a hockey stick. And what you see here in the colored lines is the predictions from the International Energy Agency, the top energy experts in the world, and here's what they say will happen to solar. And at every single point in the curve, they go, yeah, it's going to go this way. It goes up to here, they go, no, it's going to go this way. It goes up to, and this guy up here is pretty magical. It's gone like this, and he goes, no, it's going to go this way. Right? In fact, some of them go down. How do you think solar goes down? Um, and so huge implications. So I on the price. Now, some of you are from Buenos Aires. How, how would you disrupt the car wash industry? Can I just get us some comments? How would you disrupt car washes? Any thoughts? Anybody? Uh, different cars, electric cars. Maybe you have uh, nano-coated paint that doesn't hold the dirt. Maybe you have fleet washing once we get to autonomous cars. But it's not obvious, right? Well, over the last eight years, if you're in Buenos Aires, car washes have seen a 50% drop in revenues. Okay? And Santiago Belinque is one of our alumni down there, says this makes no sense. The middle class has exploded. There's a ton more Mercedes, BMWs out on the streets. We should see a doubling or tripling of car wash. Why is there a 50% drop? Is there hyper-competition? Are there legal issues? Are there water restrictions? What's going on? He spends three months researching this, and he finds the answer. And after getting rid of all the obvious things, the answer turns out to be literally Moore's Law. Over that, 50, over that eight years, we're, we're, because of computing processing power, we're, our ability to model and predict the weather has become a lot better. And in those eight years, we're exactly 50% better at knowing when it's going to rain. And when you know it's going to rain, you don't wash your car. Right? So increased computing power gives us better weather predictions, and you don't wash your car. And that's a major 50%. You might as well go home. Right? And you can be the smartest car wash owner in the world. You won't see that coming. And so our stance is today, with all of this disruption, you have to assume that you will be disrupted. Bill Gates calls this the healthy paranoia. How do you do deal with this? And, so the, and the reason this is unstoppable is this last piece. Because all of these technologies, as the cost crashes to zero, a domain becomes digital. You get cost crashing to zero. You get open source communities forming. And then you get radical disruption of the status quo. And whether it's drones or Bitcoin or biotech, you get the same pattern. So here's a fishing village in Vietnam where a ship was coming once a month to deliver diesel fuel for their boats. And then one day the ship stopped coming. There was no, it was not worth it for them. They're stuck. They have no way of powering their fishing boats. They invented a solar-powered boat. So here you have disruptive innovation using cutting-edge technologies happening at the edge of civilization. And we get very excited when we see that. Because when you, we found, we have very clear evidence when you deliver uh, new technologies to the edge of civilization, uh, economic value follows very quickly. Right? Today, any individual can enter a legacy environment with a beginner's mind, leverage new technologies, and totally disrupt it. Elon Musk has no experience in the space industry, car industry, battery industry, solar industry, and yet he has market leaders in all of them. Right? How many of you are familiar with the Hyperloop? Right? He wants to go from LA to San Francisco in about 20 minutes. Uh, I, at about 4,000 miles an hour. To give you a sense of this, I was chatting with him, and I said, Elon, I have a degree in theoretical physics. If you accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and then bring them back to zero in 20 minutes, you're probably going to kill them. 
And, and his response was, yes, it's an issue, right? It's an issue, right? I mean, in this, in this case, I'm the expert, right? I'm like, wait a minute, what are you doing? That's impossible. And he's like, yeah, we have to overcome that problem. And more importantly, I would have stopped. I would have said, no, we can't do that. And let's, let's do something else. This next generation of entrepreneurs just keeps going, right? Vitalik Buterin is 18 years old. His professors tell him he's, he can't do what he's wanting to do. He does it anyway. And boom, you have Ethereum, which is now about a $40 billion ecosystem. I think the value of Bitcoin and blockchain is unbelievable. Uh, many of you are looking at this. The more important is not the fact that it's digital currency, but the fact that I can program the currency. And when I can program monetary transactions, things become very, very interesting. And I won't get into it heavily here. Um, today, you can get $100 headsets that give you a pretty good fidelity readout as to what brainwaves going through your head. This is me wearing a headset. And on the right, you see the guy taking the photograph. He's composing music that when you play the music, puts your brain in a focused state. Here is my brain before and after he plays the music. You can see my brain is in a deep focused state. Right? My productivity goes up 500% when I'm in this state. Every knowledge worker, software developer, student in the world could use this. And he's doing this level of disruption with a Mac and a $100 headset. And that's what's possible today. And so huge implications. So then what, what do you do about it? How do you navigate this and how do you adapt to this? We saw uh, Chris Anderson wrote this book, Free, arguing that every business model over time goes to free as we have it more and more information based. And then Kevin Kelly, who's the founder of magazine, well, Wired Magazine, wrote a rebuttal. And he said, if the base information is free, there's about eight ways of adding value to it. And what he's identified here are the business models of a digital age. And any information service you, you can find will have one or more of these in it. Uh, uh, Uber gives you findability. Uber, uh, Airbnb gives you accessibility. Financial markets try and sell you immediacy, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so we have now, for the first time, a set of business models for the digital world. But this quote from David Rose is the one that's been stuck in my head now for almost 10 years. Uh, he makes the point that all of our organizations are top-down, command and control, hierarchical structures. They're designed for efficiency. They're designed for predictability. They're not designed for flexibility, agility, adaptability, or speed. And yet, today, that's the high order bit. And so he makes it, it's a little dramatic, and he's from New York, so you have to forgive him. But the point that he makes is very correct. So we, we looked at this, and we studied the top 200 fastest moving companies in the world, and said, how are they doing it? We, we, the definition we have of what's called an exponential organization is delivering minimum 10 times better than its competitors in the same space. We're tracking an index of over 100 of these types of companies. Uh, TED is a good one. 10 years ago, TED was a nice uh, conference. 1,000 people here are going to Monterey. Chris Anderson takes it over. He does three things. He establishes a huge purpose, ideas worth spreading. Then he allows anybody to watch a TED talk, puts them all on YouTube for free. And then he allows anybody to go create a TEDx event. And in 10 years, he created a global media brand. Nobody's ever done that before. So you can take an established environment, apply a set of principles, blow it open to a global level at zero cost. This is kind of interesting. This is a magical world we live in. Here's a car company that's doing the same, a similar thing. Look at the metrics on how it's blowing away a traditional car company, right? Using multiple orders of magnitude better than, in, in, than others. So there's three pieces that go into building what we call an exponential organization. They all have what I call a massive transformative purpose. Uh, Google, organize the world's information. Uh, uh, TED is this one. Uh, Coca-Cola, open happiness. We're starting to now see brands morph into this. In fact, the CEO of Unilever, uh, Paul Pullman, read this. And he ordered every brand in Unilever to take on an MTP. And now the five most profitable brands are the ones that adopted it the most. So we're starting to see this model bite. Then there's five externalities that these companies use. They keep a very small feature footprint. And they use one or more of these to move very quickly. Uber doesn't hire its own staff. TED uses community. Google uses algorithms. Airbnb is leveraging other people's assets, and so on. And then there's five internal mechanisms that allow you to drive the internal control framework and drive um, the whole uh, culture and so on. Right? Uh, we found that not everybody does all of these. If you're starting a startup, do all of them. But if you're in a legacy environment and you do four of them, 
you get a 10x performance improvement in your organization. Check out this company here. How many of you are familiar with GitHub? So GitHub is a software platform that allows collab uh, software developers to collaborate. They use all 11 characteristics, okay? Microsoft just bought this company for $7.5 billion, okay? By the way, this company has no assets, no workforce, no intellectual property. If you're an investor, how many of you would have funded a company that has no assets, workforce, or intellectual property? And yet this is what's possible. Today, if you're not building one of these, what the hell are you doing? If you can achieve this kind of an outcome. And I'll give you the so basic economic thesis behind these exponential because it's very profound. When you're running a business, you worry about demand and supply. Specifically, what's the cost of demand, what's the cost of supply? And hopefully you're on the right side of that equation. When the internet came along, it allowed us to drop the cost of demand exponentially. Online marketing, referral marketing, every Silicon Valley company is going for the holy grail of a viral loop. And if you can get to that, your cost of customer acquisition goes to zero. Very interesting, right? And that's on the demand side. But what these exponential organizations have figured out is how do you drop the cost of supply exponentially? Think about Airbnb. The marginal cost of adding a room to their inventory is almost zero. If you're Hyatt, you have to build a hotel. Right? And so now you have multiple industries. We have startups entering that has very low marginal cost of supply, and that's an existential threat to the incumbents. Because if you have low marginal cost of supply, you take out the denominator, your market cap explodes. And that's why they're doing so well in the market. We actually applied this to the public markets. We created a diagnostic survey that you can, you can, it's free to take, it takes about 15 minutes, to score how flexible is your, uh, and quantifiable is, how flexible and adaptable is your organization. So here's the Fortune 100, ranked by how flexible and adaptable their organization structures are. We found this correlates to stock market performance. In fact, if you'd invested in the top 10 most flexible organizations, you would have outperformed the S&P by almost three times. Right? Because as the external world becomes more volatile, what drives market performance is your ability to adapt. Right? Makes sense. So we're creating an index fund. Where we're just going to score every stock market and invest in the top 10 most flexible ones. Right? Very interesting there. We are starting to see companies get this. They're starting to update their leadership. The big structural recommendation we have is do not do disruptive innovation in the core organization. You'll hit this immune system problem and you'll get into a big political fight. Do disruptive innovation at the edge of the organization, pointing into adjacent spaces. Uh, Larry Page came to me a few years ago and said, hey, your unit at Yahoo is successful. Should I do that at Google? And I said, no, you'll have this immune system problem. Do something like it, keep it stealth, point it away, and you see the result of, as Google X, where they have their core management capabilities, but they have hardware, Google Glass, Google Car, contact lenses to go into adjacent spaces. The master of this technique, though, is Apple. Hyper successful company, yes, they have a great technology supply chain and a great design capability. I argue that Apple's real innovation is organizational. Because what they do, unlike anybody else in the world, is they will form a small team that's very disruptive. They will take that team to the edge of the organization. They will keep that team totally secret, and they will say to them, go disrupt another industry. Right? Nobody does this. Nobody's even noticed that this is what they do. So they have a portfolio of teams looking at different industries. When they're, they think something is ready for disruption, they fold it back into the iTunes platform and messing with people's uh, brains. Um, uh, and what we've been doing recently is we've been attacking this immune system problem. So we came up with a 10-week process that actually moves leadership, culture, management thinking three years ahead in 10 weeks. We piloted this with Procter & Gamble. We've now done it about a dozen times. And we actually open sourced this, this methodology. We've, we're so excited by this that we wrote a second book that anybody can take, run it inside your organization, and move the leadership, culture, and management three years ahead. Uh, our second client, which was Interprotección, the largest insurance brokerage in Mexico, doubled their revenues and tripled their profits in three years. And so we're seeing amazing results from this. We've run it with a whole bunch of companies, Rossini in Mexico, Visa in Brazil, and others. So we're pretty excited by this. So I'm going to pause there. What we're seeing today is a radical shift in how the world is operating. 
12 or so technologies all doubling, in, each of them doubling in itself. Each of them doubling where they intersect is a whole other multiple part of the equation. This is stressing all of our business structures and all of our institutions globally, but the opportunity on the other side as a business is profound. So if you can organize your business in the right way, you have unbelievable returns that you can make. So I hope that's been helpful. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Salim. Eh, bueno, yo creo que después de esta exposición nos quedamos con una idea, la importancia de, la, de las innovaciones y la importancia de la flexibilidad en las organizaciones y también en los países y en las economías para poder incorporar todo esto en, en beneficio de un, de un mayor crecimiento y un mayor desarrollo. Con eso terminamos eh, nuestro seminario Latam Focus. Muchas gracias por haber asistido y nos encontraremos el próximo año nuevamente. Gracias.